So yes, thank you all for inviting me. Um, so I'm working at Microsoft in the developer uh, division, uh, working on VS Code, Visual Studio, GitHub, and some major uh, um, path. Uh, I've been working on a um, 3D and open source um, engine named Babylon JS. Um, um, some of you may know, like it's like competitor of 3.js. And as I was um, like doing 3D, that uh, uses uh, use a lot of the GPU and then take a lot of on you know energy. I wanted to maybe think about the impact for the planet. You talk about that. Um, we I I hope I don't need to convince you that we should should uh, take care of of you know the planet uh, in every detail possible, including us developers. So I wanted to spend time digging into that um, and trying to to check uh, about PWM. My previous job at Microsoft was working on PWA Builder, and I was helping uh, people to build PWA to push that to the Microsoft Store, but to the Play Store too. And now we even have iOS support. Um, so I wanted to more focus on the client side uh, because web obviously is a complex topic. It's client, network, and server. But I wanted to focus more of this presentation on, on client. Just want to be sure that uh, you can see my screen correctly because I can see uh, the Zoom UI on my side. You all see only the the deck. Indeed. Yes. Okay, great. All was about correctly in full screen. All good. Great. So why should we matter? The agenda will be pretty simple, like why should we matter about energy consumption of a PWA? And for that, we need to understand, you know, uh, which kind of devices are going to host our PWAs or web app in a more general manner. And, and the main source of energy uh, on those devices, like uh, which part of the device consume, consume the most. Uh, I had to do some researches on some tooling to measure the energy consumption of a web app. And then I started to do some benchmarking. I had some assumption, the hypothesis that I tried to validate. And obviously I haven't been able to, to dig everything. I got ideas for the future, which is something pretty new. Unfortunately, maybe we should have been um, paying more attention uh, on this topic before. But uh, since I've been doing this presentation, Microsoft and other company have worked together to try to put all ideas we've got, maybe new pattern of development, and we created the Green Software Foundation, so you can search for it, where we are trying to, you know, to to think about new ways to build, uh, you know, sustainable AI, sustainable uh, apps in general. So this is new, so we need to do some researches together. So why should we bother about PWA? So I put web apps everywhere all the time. People tend to forget about that, but what we've seen at uh, on Windows, so obviously I'm a Microsoft employee, so I will talk about Windows, but you know, there's a lot of Windows machines and the telemetry we had is 60% uh, of the time is spent inside a browser, whatever the browser is, you know, on a PC, which means that a lot of people are still obviously using web and then web apps which means that we have a huge opportunity as web developers to maybe optimize what we do regarding energy consumption, because most of the time spent on the, on the PC is inside the, on the web. So there is obviously three sources of energy regarding the life of a web app, I would say. First, the hosting itself, the location could be important. We're going to see that together just after that. The network infrastructure, the way the data will flow from the server up to your uh, browser is obviously important. Uh, this is more difficult to control on our side and also difficult to measure, but this is some, some stuff you can measure and evaluate. And if you see the client, we are more in control of what's going to happen on the client side. This would be our main center of interest today. So I don't know if you know this website, but it's for me, it's fascinating. Uh, it's electricitymap.org where uh, you can check the type of uh, how, how clean or not bad the energy uh, source are regarding the various countries uh, in Europe on this uh, on this screenshot. Um, France is well known to be relatively green thanks to nuclear energy. There are some drawbacks about nuclear energy, but one of the good aspects of it is like it's a low carbon uh, energy. Uh, we know that Germany, for instance, made a different bet, and today we can see that um, the the level of uh, carbon emitted for producing energy is not good. So it means that if you start to think about that, it really means that um, maybe 
putting your server on a different country can already have some kind of impact. So obviously, this is not as simple as that. Uh, if I put like if I put all my servers were web server in France because it's supposed to be greener, um, we need to take into account the latency to address our customers or you know on the network also cost uh, regarding energy. But I thought it was interesting to see that. Uh, already thinking about uh, the country where you're going to host your uh, your code is going to have a, a different impact. So it's kind of an overview of that. Um, regarding um, network, so I, I, I don't know if everybody knows about what is a progressive web app, a PWA, but one of the main pieces uh, of a PWA is a service worker, which acts as a kind of a proxy, which is a JavaScript piece of code uh, that will be like a layer between your uh, client code and, and the server. So you can catch fetch request and do your own uh, cache logic there. This is super helpful in a case also potentially in the case of uh, trying to be greener for your web app because you can reduce the number of uh, web uh, network requests to the server. You can also improve the performance and, and you know um, uh, reactivity of your web app. So the idea is now that we are closer to native apps because PWA also most of the time we are associating PWA with modern technology, you know, the latest uh, good technology. We have file access, lots of stuff that we can do now with web app. That, that's what we are super close to native app. Can we act on the energy consumption? So first we need to inspect the various devices. So it was like a stupid joke I wanted to do. <laughs> Obviously you can replace that with Chrome inspect uh, devices. So where should we focus our efforts? Um, this is a movie I really like on my side named The Usual Suspects. Um, and this was exactly the, <laughs> the process I use. This is my own story of trying to discover what could uh, take some energy. I had some hypothesis once again. I was suspecting the CPU, of, obviously, the GPU. I wasn't sure about the network or the, sensor, or the sensor. And I had also some maybe idea about the screen itself. So let's have a look uh, to what consumes the most energy. So let's start by desktop uh, CPUs. Uh, desktop CPUs are really interesting because <laughs> obviously they consume a lot more energy than uh, laptop or smartphones. Uh, you can see that the energy is going to vary from uh, 55 watts. So it's not in idle mode. It's when the CPU is really used, like uh, for instance, when I'm using Zoom or uh, any kind of uh, communication tools going to consume a lot of energy because of audio, video, a lot of stuff being done. So you can see that based on the PC you're going to use, you're going to consume from 50 watts up more than 100, up to 150 watts. So a lot of energy there. So it's really interesting to then maybe think about CPU consumption. Regarding motherboard, uh, motherboard is going to vary based on the, um, is it an iron motherboard? Like is it a gaming motherboard or not? But it's going to vary from 25 to 80 watts. So it's really interesting to have kind of idea of the scale of each component. So motherboard could be, could take some energy because it's contained like the network stack, Wi-Fi, you need to also power a lot of, of chips. Uh, so it makes sense that you need some energies. Regarding uh, the memory, so I was asking myself, you know, a lot of people are complaining like, oh, you know, a tab in Chrome, Edge oh, yeah, is consuming so much memory. This is a nightmare. It's going you know, to consume a lot of energy and blah, blah, blah. We need to optimize that. I think we need to optimize that. But when we look at that through the angle of energy consumption, it turned out that the memory itself is not consuming a lot of energy. Obviously, this doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to reduce the footprint of your apps in, in memory, because the more memory you will use, Obviously, then you will start to have other issues. You know, you will have the, the, the machine will start to dump some part of the memory on the hard drive, and then you will start to slower down the app and consume more energy. But RAM itself is not consuming a lot of energy. And what was super interesting for me, I didn't know that, if you double your memory RAM by taking two sticks of, for instance, four gigabytes and replace them by two sticks of, I don't know, 30, um, uh, 32 gigabytes is going to consume the same level of energy. So maybe if memory itself is not that important to focus uh, in a PWA to try to optimize ne energy consumption. GPU, of course, <laughs> GPU, so it's going to vary a lot. I've got this big GPU on my desktop machine, which means that when I'm using it, obviously it's going to take up to 350 watts, which is huge. Um, 
Uh, and it means that you need, we will see that you need to use a GPU sometime to improve the energy consumption, but you need to be very cautious when you use a GPU because if you do like gaming type of scenario, obviously the energy consumption is going to really increase a lot. So, so far we've seen that CPU is uh, one of the most important candidates, GPU. Uh, regarding our drive, I thought it was interesting, a lot of PCs, smartphones, and even console got now SSDs, which is, are well known to consume really few energy and are super fast. So, uh, but even classical hard drive wasn't consuming uh, so much energy compared to uh, to the CPU, for instance. So, I/O are interesting to consider, but less less much than the CPU and GPU. Regarding screen, uh, screen on on desktop and even more on, on smaller machines like laptop and, and smartphone uh, uh, is one of the most consuming uh, parts of a device. So obviously it's going to depend on the size of the screen. Um, so on my side, I've got this big screen at home once again. So my PC is not well, well known to be good for, for the planet. Um, so you need to pay attention also on which PC you will code your web app because it's going to consume much more energy sometimes for the same outcome. But you see that it's going to vary from a couple of watts, 23 up to more than 100 watts. So uh, unfortunately, we see that we cannot really control um, the consumption of a screen ourselves with a, uh, as a web developer. Our smartphone, this is something also interesting. Um, we can see that 2G is consuming less energy than 3G or even Wi-Fi. But often you think like, okay, Wi-Fi is consuming more energy than 3G or 4G. So does it mean that I need to use 4G instead of Wi-Fi to, you know, to take to take less energy? Well, not really, because we have to keep something in mind. Is is not because for um, you know in peak I would say one part of the device is consuming more energy that it would be less efficient. What's really important is the global energy is going to be taken to do a task. And obviously the Wi-Fi is going to take more energy for one second of usage, for instance, compared to 4G, but it can download or do the task way faster. So at the end, the overall energy being consumed will be less than using 3G or 4G, for instance. So we, we have global idea of you know, how far a device could consume, but it doesn't mean sometimes that we, uh, we shouldn't use it, this part of the device. I was curious about, you know, uh, you know, even is, with web API, you can do, you can play with the accelerometer and stuff like that. They are, cons they are consuming milliwatts, so we shouldn't, uh, I think, spend time trying to optimize that part using our code. Uh, regarding smartphones, once again, we can see that CPU, like desktop and GPU, are consuming a lot, consuming a lot of energy. The cellular part all up is going to consume more energy than Wi-Fi because of what I've said. Most of the time, it needs more time to consume energy. And also, you know, when you're moving with your smartphone, it's got difficulties to try to track the various cellular um, antennas. So it's going to consume a lot of energy. And backlight, unfortunately, is almost like consuming uh, as energy as everything else combined. Like the, it's the pure LCD part is not consuming a lot of energy, but to be able to view something, you know, with LCD screen, you need backlight and this, this is consuming a lot of energy, unfortunately. Um, so we we'll see that you cannot control that using Web API. I know we have lots of great people from the W3C there and, and working also for a company like Google. Maybe we should think about enabling an API to control the backlight to be able to consume less energy uh, if needed. This is something fun while I was doing my researches. Uh, I am a fan uh, of this kind of stuff. I've discovered that uh, blue light consumes more energy than other. And I think, oh, maybe this would be interesting for a kind of a not responsive design, but green design, like should we remove blue from all our websites? Uh, and I was wondering why. So it's because of this uh, uh, famous formula. Um, which means that based you know, on, the, on the length of the light, you're going to consume more or less energy. So I thought, like, would it be interesting to try to benchmark that? Uh, so it's like the fun part of the presentation, I would say. So is it useful? Like, is it something useful uh, for web developer? 
And I'm going to spoil the answer no, uh, unfortunately. I'm going to explain why, because I often have the question about this specific uh, part. So I've done some benchmark, uh, very basic HTML and CSS, like full, full green, uh, full blue, sorry, or full red, and trying to measure the energy being consumed there. Um, what I've discovered using um, an Android S8 uh, Samsung smartphone uh, with a watt meter, uh, I've been able to see slight differences, which is fun, between uh, the blue screen and the red screen, like uh, 0.1 uh, watt, so uh, 100 milliwatt, uh, which could be interesting, you know, on, on a long period of, of usage. And black screen also is going to consume less energy because we know that OLED, you know, is going to completely um, uh, shut down the pixel when you've got pure black compared to LCD, we don't have backlight. So I was saying like, oh, maybe it would be interesting to, to optimize the design using different colors to consume less energy. And then I've done some benchmark on this machine, which is a Surface Laptop 2, which got LCD screen. And we've got exactly the same consumption um, for a specific reason. Whatever the color you're going to display on LCD screen, is, you will always have the backlight more or less uh, you know, enabled. Uh, which means that it's not like OLED screen, like whatever the screen you're going to use, even if you're using like a black uh, theme, for instance, or dark theme. I've got a lot of people that I've seen on social network thinking like, oh, I'm using, you know, VS Code or whatever uh, tool you love uh, in dark theme to consume less energy. On an LCD screen, this is not true. On an OLED screen, it's going to be true. Unfortunately, it's very rare that we use OLED screen uh, to develop or to browse the web uh, outside of the smartphone, maybe. So I wanted also to check like uh, someone I really like in France doing uh, video gaming. He's got the blog with two theme, light theme and dark theme. And I've been able to see uh, uh, in a static usage that I was using less energy on the dark theme on my uh, OLED uh, smartphone. And obviously on the Surface laptop, the, using LCD screen, a very same level of energy, whatever the the way to consume the, the block. So this is just explanation on why. Um, and so it was my first study. So I was, now we know that CPU is important, GPU is important, the screen itself is important, and maybe we shouldn't spend too much time trying to optimize the CSS to use, you know, dark or light theme outside of maybe uh, for the comfort of people or, you know, accessibility, but for uh, energy consumption itself, uh, it doesn't seem to be interesting to focus on that. So now we need to some tool to be able to measure and validate some of our assumptions. Um, so we have the hardware version, which is a, a watt meter, very cheap way and fun way to uh, benchmark uh, your stuff. So the way to use it, you need to plug uh, either your uh, smartphone um, or uh, laptop or whatever. If you got a battery, you need to have 100 battery, obviously, it's, it needs to be full charge. Otherwise, the watt meter will also measure the fact that your battery is taking energy to fill the battery. So once your battery is 100 percent, you will be able to see variation of power consumption based on the web apps you will use. I think it's very fun to, uh, to, to discover as a first way the way various web apps could uh, consume energy. Just using a web meter, it's going to cost you maybe 20 euros uh, on Amazon. So it's relatively cheap and you can use it for, you know, to measure also what your fridge is consuming. Like I ended up measuring everything in my house to uh, benchmark the energy consumption of every device in my house. We also have the Windows Task Manager that can already give you a level of energy consumption regarding the CPU. So you know that my JavaScript is monothreaded, so you need to find one of the core being used. Uh, and also we have, um, Interestingly, the GPU usage now on Windows, so, and you can you see like I'm using Microsoft Edge there, I can see that the, the percentage uh, of usage of my GPU, and obviously we know that is going to impact a lot the energy consumption based on what we've seen uh, previously. Uh, regarding uh, the Chromium browser, you have the task manager integrated, uh, which is a shift plus escape. Unfortunately, you don't have really interesting uh, metrics there because it, you're going to see CPU, but I was already being able to see that in the test manager of Windows, the network and the memory. And we've seen that the memory is interesting to be able to optimize like as a good developer because uh, it needs to take the less memory possible. But regarding memory um, energy consumption, this is not metrics that I was interested in too. 
So I started to have other uh, tools. Obviously, there is Lighthouse, which is super well known. Lighthouse is interesting because it's going to give you global performance of your web app. And also, it was going to tell you that do you have a service worker or stuff like that, going to give you like uh, advices on how to optimize your app. But don't forget that this is um, pure performance doesn't always mean a better energy uh, efficiency. Uh, and we're going to see like a, a benchmark that we're going to, uh, it's going to highlight that just after that. But Lighthouse is a good way to see like if performance are really bad, it probably means that your app is going to consume more energy if you would be able to optimize it uh, a little bit. Android Studio also could uh, give you some kind of interesting uh, metrics. Um, I haven't been able to uh, doing my first uh, test to uh, directly measure um, like a web app or uh, install PWA uh, on Android using uh, that. Uh, but maybe uh, I've done I've done my research like almost one year ago. So maybe Android Studio can directly attach to um, to Chrome on Android. But uh, this is one of the tools that was interesting to check. And uh, I know a French um, startup uh, that. Um, uh, named Green Spectre, when you can give, give a website URL like Lighthouse in a way or PW Builder, this is the same kind of concept. And what they are doing uh, on their server side, they have real uh, hardware device with sensor connected there. And they're going to execute your web app, uh, take different snapshots and evaluate uh, with, I would say, a relatively good accuracy, uh, the energy consumption of your uh, website and they're going to send you a report after that. This company is, is uh, making most of their business doing consultancies, which means that they are not ready to open source uh, their knowledge there. But that, I thought it was interesting and maybe we should be also inspired in the future to provide this kind of metric, maybe inside Lighthouse, uh, maybe now Lighthouse got like uh, some kind of metric like green metric, I don't know how to, to name them. But this website is really interesting and then you will have a kind of a report saying like, you know, how good you are, uh, in which part you're spending most of the uh, um, energy, like is it the loading phase, the scrolling part, um, and an average energy consumption on, on smartphone. So, and I've been evaluating PW Builder. So my uh, developer uh, working for me when I was working for the PW Builder project did a great job using uh, building the website. So most of the researches I've been doing was uh, regarding the um, Get Battery API. Um, I thought it would be awesome if I would able to, to be to do some kind of timestamp like uh, benchmarks once again. Let's load my website, do kind of a snapshot like this is the level of battery, uh, finish my task and do a, a snapshot of level of battery and trying to make a difference to evaluate the energy consumption. Unfortunately, as you can see, the accuracy of the battery level is, is um, not precise enough. Uh, apparently for security reason, uh, I've been discussing with people like, uh, in on the edge and steam and same for obviously uh, on the Chrome side. Uh, I would have loved, this is a feedback I'm giving while I've got this opportunity to share that with some of you. I would have loved like a kind of a developer mode where I could unlock the uh, precision level to be able like on localhost or whatever way to enable it to be able to uh, measure the battery level using JavaScript because I would be able to precisely measure like you know, part of my code taking time, like uh, with maybe a JavaScript framework that we could build to help people to measure that. So the still, I had some idea to use it. We see that at the end to use it as is today, but it wasn't precise enough to be efficient, interesting for my, my test. We have a tool named Power CFG. We have the same kind of tool on, on Android or Mac or Linux, um, but I'm not an expert in those uh, operating systems. So, uh, but this tool is using by, you know, Windows, like on iPhone or Android, you have the list, you know, um, of application taking the most of your battery. So on our side, we have this tool. This tool is um, has been created using, um, uh, at the beginning, real sensor in labs on Windows machine, when we can measure you know, the network stack, the CPU, GPU, uh, uh, everything on the machine. And we build a kind of a mathematical model, like almost machine learning in a way, to be able to have a software uh, uh, version of this, um, uh, energy consumption model. Um, so this is what we're using uh, on Windows today to tell you that apparently in my case, I'm spending most of my time in Edge and then Outlook. Um, so you can use this tool to uh, 
to run it, it's going to monitor every process on your machine, and then uh, it's going to save it as a CSV that you can load in Excel or whatever to be able to check the energy spent on the CPU, on the network, on the GPU uh, uh, in Joule. So this is really useful because it's much more precise than the one meter, obviously. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to give you a, a through windows of one minute. And regarding, you know, the browser, like, you know, whatever the browser is, you know, you have multiple tabs inside the browser, which means that it cannot see which tab is going to consume the most energy. So what you have to do is to close everything, use a single tab, run the tool and benchmark this way, the way the browser itself uh, is consuming energy using a single tab to try to be the closest possible to what the web app is consuming. So I have some benchmark trying to, uh, to verify some of my assumptions thanks to that. Um, obviously, I was curious about uh, WebAssembly versus JavaScript uh, because it was obvious for me that JavaScript could probably take more uh, CPU energy compared to uh, WebAssembly. So I had this um, demo I was using uh, to do kind of face tracking in, in, uh, inside a web app using a kind of pure JavaScript uh, AI face tracking. Uh, and JavaScript is not well known to be very good in this case. It was consuming, as you can see on my watt meter there, 10 watts approximately, but the performance was really bad. Uh, two frames per second to be able to track my face uh, because of the nature of JavaScript once again. So I needed some help. So I, I'm using the same algorithm ported to WebAssembly that is using like OpenCV or a library like that and try to measure the difference. And it was super interesting because the performance is boosted to 30 FPS. So regarding the UX, it was super interesting. But then you see almost 18 watts in exchange. And this was an interesting learning for me. It means that uh, I'm, I, I'm providing a better user experience to the user, obviously, because it's like it's way more smooth to be able to track face, but at the cost of consuming more energy. So this is coming back to what I was saying, like for, with light out, for instance, it doesn't mean that if your app is more performant, that is better regarding energy consumption. Sometimes to be more performant, you, you're going to use more energy from the CPU. So we probably need to find a trade-off between you know, the ultimate user experience. Should we really need to need uh, 60 FPS everywhere on the page? Uh, or can we lower that a little bit to be, able to, to be able to consume less energy? So obviously, unfortunately, I've been able to find cases where um, WebAssembly was useful. So there is a, a benchmark doing PDF-like uh, operation uh, uh, that I've been able to use. So we've been able to see that the Java, pure JavaScript version was taking 45 seconds compared to 25 seconds regarding WebAssembly. When I was using my watt meter, it wasn't precise enough, but I was able that maximum energy usage was 25 watts during this time, uh, this period using JavaScript, and it was going higher using uh, WebAssembly. But once again, it's not because it's going higher in peak that this is worse. And using poor CFG, you see that it's consuming less energy all up uh, compared to, um, to, to JavaScript. So using WebAssembly in this specific scenario was better regarding energy consumption and potentially better for the planet. So it was interesting to, to check that we've got one case where better UX, but less good for energy, and another case where it's better UX and better for uh, the energy consumption. As we don't have uh, JavaScript uh, multi-threading yet, I would say, um, we have like the, um, the lowest version of it, which are web workers. So obviously we are not doing ray tracing every day, but I've been able to benchmark that it was uh, interesting to use uh, ray tracing in this kind of scenario. So this is a multi-core CPU. Uh, so I've been able to improve a lot the performance, obviously, and consume far less energy uh, using uh, the ray tracing uh, version with web workers. And web workers obviously can be used in not, not just only ray tracing, but trying to do a task. Uh, for instance, when you're doing a network requests and you have to process some of the data, uh, we know that it could be more efficient sometimes to use it, not always, but it could be more efficient and could also mean that we will better use uh, the CPU itself. Video quality, we are spending a lot of time watching videos. Um, so I've been benchmarking uh, YouTube, the same video available on YouTube. It was one of my own video. Uh, obviously, it was interesting that uh, 
the, the higher you go in resolution, the more you're going to consume uh, the GPU usage and obviously uh, uh, energy. So using my watt, watt meter, it was enough to, to benchmark it. It means that um, you shouldn't always send, obviously, uh, the uh, higher uh, resolution or frame rate to the machine. Uh, YouTube is doing that for you, uh, fortunately. But if you're building your own service or if you're you know, building videos on your own website, you should pay attention to that because it's going to consume way more energy to provide a 4K video compared to a full HD or even like low quality videos uh, to probably let your boss speak to all the company, pay attention to that. So energy about videos is taking a lot of energy uh, for sure. We have kind of power CFG wording uh, also on every apps on Windows machine. And this was interesting to see. So this is a popular um, uh, streaming app that I cannot share the name of, but you probably be able to find it. Uh, during the beginning of the COVID, uh, you know, those streaming apps have reduced the um, resolution for bandwidth reason and uh, to lower down the quality of videos. And we've seen on the client machine that the energy has dramatically went down, which correlates a lot to the fact that the higher you will go in resolution or frame rate, the higher you will, uh, the, the more you will consume energy. So we need to find the right trade-off between acceptable quality and energy consumption there. This one is interesting, and this is one of my latest uh, demo. <laughs> you know, I'm a WebGL fan and video gaming fan, so I've been building a game. And I'm going to run this video with my uh, wet meter there and have a look to the fact that I'm going to play with the zoom level and uh, have a look to the impact on the um, energy consumption. So I'm currently 100%. I'm going to increase the zoom level. And you see that the wet meter is going to show less energy like almost half of it. And my WebGL game is still running there. And now I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to uh, uh, go back to the 100% zoom level and the energy is going to increase. <laughs> and I thought it was super interesting based on the zoom level I have, the energy consumption is going to vary from like 2X almost. For a specific reason, I'm using the canvas element and this is something well known in video game. If you don't have enough po uh, power to do a full screen uh, you know, game, you're going to compute everything in a smaller canvas and stretch it. And this is exactly what the browser is doing in a way. When I'm zooming it, the image is going to become blur blurry because I've got like uh, the, the, the logical size of the canvas is going to go down and going to be stretched and then going to use this energy, which means that once again, maybe we shouldn't target uh, 4K rendering uh, on the web or 60 frames per second. We should pay attention also to the way we render pixels on the web to consume less energy. And the last one, service worker. I was curious about, uh, should, can I save energy? I've done an experiment trying to play a DRM file um, online or in airplane mode. Obviously, I'm not taking into account the fact that I needed to download the file completely at the beginning. That's going to take a lot of energy. But just to imagine, like, imagine you got a lot of data uh, in your service worker cache. What would be the energy saving you could have using it? In my case, I've been able to save 12% of energy thanks to the service worker by loading the data from my uh, service worker cache compared to loading the data directly from the network. So it means that using smart service worker, it doesn't mean that all service worker will save some energy, but if you design a service worker to reduce down the, the network, you can also uh, network bandwidth, you can also improve um, a bit the energy consumption. So it, this is super interesting. My idea for the future uh, that I haven't tested yet, uh, is SVG uh, versus like PNG JPEG files better regarding a, or uh, worse regarding energy consumption? I'm not sure. Big image versus small image, like you know, lazy loading, uh, network uh, footprint. Is it going to have huge impact or not regarding energy consumption? I should uh, I should benchmark that. I had some. Um, I don't. We have people living in Germany. I guess that I have some stupid idea like saying like, let's imagine that I'm 
dynamically checking that you're based in Germany and we think that maybe it's going to consume more uh, carbon in Germany should we <laughs> lower down the quality of video or image coming from there, uh, trying to maybe adapt ourselves based on the map of we know that the energy is not good in specific you know, uh, region of the world, maybe sh we should automatically adapt the quality based on that. Um, trying to do less frequent service worker cache updates also, because if you're using a service worker to improve the, the, the performance, but you keep spending downloading all the same data from the network, you're not going to lower down the energy consumption. So we need to be smart in the um, way to be design the service worker. I was thinking about using the battery API to maybe check the level of battery and uh, reaching a certain threshold to switch the design of the website or maybe do less polling, uh, this kind of stuff, trying to optimize the site when we see that we currently using too much battery, even if it's not super precise, we can have kind of a trigger to enable. And should we think about CSS or JavaScript framework to help developer to being sustainable PWA, once we will have been able to find some kind of um, design pattern that makes sense regarding uh, efficiency for uh, energy consumption. And this is everything uh, I had to share so far to keep a little bit of time for questions. <laughs> Thanks a lot, David, for the, the great presentation and the uh, very thorough review of the potential sources of power consumption in, uh, on the web. Uh, while people queue for questions, I'll start with uh, one of my own. So very recently, there was a, a committee group started in WCC to look at uh, sustainability of all technologies, the technologies WCC standardized. Uh, I wonder if based on your experience looking at the uh, usage of this technology, if you also have any insight about what could make the technologies themselves uh, more power efficient, less costly to, to run, any early insight that uh, you might be in position to share? Well, what I've seen is it probably needs to be a combination of what, you know, the spec you're working on, um, the browser themselves, they have a huge work in optimizing, obviously, the energy consumption, being able to offload some of the work that is sometimes done on the CPU and the GPU. For instance, we've been working with VLC for the Windows machine because VLC is one of the top most apps used on Windows. And this is a broader initiative we have at Microsoft, not just web. And we've seen that being able to use different codecs to offload some of the work from the CPU to the GPU, we've been able to save a lot of energy. Uh, so I think like regarding also this kind of rendering that we may have in complex web page, trying to really think regarding obviously pure performance in this case, trying to offload to GPU would make sense, but also always trying to also measure the counterpart of it. Like the WebAssembly one was interesting for me, like being able to improve the performance at the cost, which means that we probably need to have kind of a cutter, you know, that would say, I, I would like to have the IS performance. Like, you know, on my Windows machine, I've got this kind of a metric for the battery. I want, I want to consume as much battery as I can. I don't care about the battery. I need the maximum performance. I want to lower down the performance. Sometimes, I, I, I don't know if it's still the case, but the browser used to, you know, lower down, for instance, the request animation loop or the kind of trigger. I'm not going to query it like 60, 60 times per second. Maybe we could lower down that this kind of metric to be able to have this kind of loop and the developer or the system could say, please slow down this app because it's consumed too much memory. Um, so I, I would think that it's it's a combination of everybody thinking about the specs itself that need to be controlled in a way to lower down the, the energy consumption, the browser vendor for sure, and the developer need to be educated to know where they're going to spend to, to, to consume a lot of energy and trying to act that with a slightly different angle that, um, you know, tools like Lighthouse is giving, is going to give like pure performance, like loading time, SEO, stuff like that. We need to have a different angle regarding energy consumption this time. Yeah, so the articulation of the trade-off between performance as uh, efficiency and performance as the power that you consume, I think that's yeah, certainly yeah. a very important lesson. Uh, Alexandre, I see you made a comment on the chat. Do you want to, to raise a question or? Yes, uh, maybe I can speak uh, orally for this. Uh, I I have read that uh, during the life cycle of uh, electronic devices in general, 
species included. Uh, what has the highest carbon footprint is the manufacturing of the device and yep. not necessarily the uh, electricity that it uses during its life cycle. So my question is for web applications, is it relevant to uh, try to make applications that require less powerful devices that are also greener to manufacture? This is an excellent question, and you're completely right. Uh, the footprint that uh, the worst one is regarding manufacturing of the devices. So we shouldn't like uh, buy a new iPhone every year for sure, uh, because you can do uh, great effort on your web code is not going to have uh, any kind of a uh, true impact. Um, that's why I wanted also to focus specifically on what we can do as developers, like um, like trying to avoid to buy new device every year is not in our control directly. Um, in a certain way, like you said, like if if I'm taking into uh, granted that I will have a new iPhone next year with a new GPU, so I can use my a new shaders, a new complex model, and I don't care about previous machine. I will kind of push that in the wrong direction. So you're right. We should take into account uh, uh, low uh, powerful devices. And to be honest, I've got the feeling that um, a lot of people are taking care when they are trying to build app at a global scale, because we know, for instance, you know, in, in Asia, in India, they've got not uh, as powerful devices as in West Europe and USA. But you're right, like this is part of, so of our mission as web developer uh, to, to develop on uh, not like the latest Mac machine with uh, M1 Max, <laughs> but to use, like I would say, average CPU and GPU to test our code and to be sure that it runs correctly. But you're right, like um, uh, sustainability is a global issue regarding the server, you know, uh, the cloud provider are doing, I would say, good job for all of them there, uh, but we shouldn't as user buy a new device every year because otherwise it will kill our effort in a way uh, of optimizing our code. Thank you very much. Okay, I see no one raising question on the chat or raising their hand, so I'll, I'll take it that it's probably uh, good enough for today and we also need to uh, go to the next Thank talks. But, but again, thanks a lot, David. I think that was a, a really a very interesting set of insights about how uh, our code actually impacts uh, at the end of the day the end user power consumption. So th thanks a lot thanks. for that. And everybody needs to think about that. And if you got ideas, new pattern, new algorithm, whatever, please share them and uh, have a look to the Green Software Foundation. That is a, you know, a really open foundation if you like to follow what we're trying to do, uh, because we are just at the beginning of it, I would say. Thanks Thank a lot much. again. Thank you. And, and by the way, uh, I, I submitted your proposal about the battery API. Um, that's a good idea. Um, you will see an uh, e email in your inbox. Um, let's do one thing. Um, let's unmute all and just give David a big round of applause. I know it's weird, but still. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. OK, thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. So my name is Jerry Terda. Uh, the topic I'm going to present you is uh, web navigation traces, graph structures, and 3D rendering. Um, the short title for this work is Works in Cyberspace. So before moving on, please let me first give you some context details. I'm a research engineer working at Orange, and my co-authors are Raphael Tronsi from the Uricom Institute, and uh, also Johan Chabot uh, from Orange. So Orange uh, is a well-known leading international network infrastructure and service provider. And as such, uh, it has great concerns about uh, complex network resilience and uh, data security. Uh, this is where our project takes its roots with a user and equipment behavioral analysis perspective. And we hope that you'll find this interesting work uh, including uh, appreciating the exciting directions that are coming from grass structures and the spatial reasoning on this topic. So first assume that uh, we as web users have some uh, web browsing agenda in mind and that afterwards some uh, web navigation session we'd like to analyze the web browsing history uh, with respect to the data pass that is used and uh, with respect also to web resources locations. So this, for example, 
could uh, respond to green deal or privacy concerns. So at the opposite side of the network, let's imagine a content delivery platform engineer wishing to evaluate the performance of its platform with respect to the user's uh, navigation context. Uh, this here could respond to, for example, uh, evaluating the optimality of some resource allocation policy. And finally, let's imagine a security analyst uh, wishing to structure traces data in such way that uh, he could uh, easily assess the legitimacy of uh, some course of action with respect to both user actions and uh, data assets characteristics and uh, localizations. So here, I think we may intuitively see that uh, tackling the questions for all these three personas um, rely on common ground. Uh, however, we need further insights before moving on. So first we see that uh, we must understand uh, what are the characteristics uh, for uh, data collection of web traces. And second, we need to find a convenient data representation for handling both uh, user actions and network infrastructure details. And for this, our proposed approach is twofold, starting with the study of strengths and weaknesses of standard data collection tools. And second, uh, with a study of our network infrastructure details are revealed depending on the user's navigation activity. So as uh, user actions and network infrastructure details are to be interrelated, uh, we'll make use of multi-level uh, graphs for data representation for the system approach they offer and also for the mathematical tools they enable, uh, derived from the graph theory, for uh, the study of uh, the structure of structural aspects of the data. Uh, so to give substance to our approach, we make use of an experimental setup uh, composed of two main components. The first one makes use of uh, classical network traffic dumping tools, uh, such as the T-Shark tool from the Wireshark framework. Uh, this is for the live packet capture scenarios that we'll be discussing thereafter. And the second uh, uh, tool is a Firefox network monitor component for the in-web browser uh, capture uh, scenario. Uh, captured data is then forwarded to our second main component, that is a web application for uh, 3D rendering of the graph data uh, derived from the navigation traces and further uh, data analysis. So our evaluation strategy here is uh, to compare all the outcomes of both our live packet and in-web browser capture scenarios on uh, similar and arbitrary web navigation sessions. And to make this more clear, uh, let me show you a short video recorded example that is also available on our repository. So here, the screen is divided into three panels. On the lower left side, you'll find the user's web browser. On the upper left side is a command line interface to call uh, the data collection process. And on the right side, you'll find uh, the final component that is a web app for 3D rendering and analysis. We begin with the live packet capture scenario. So we first call on uh, the data collection process, then we connect to the graph stream. And then we do some uh, web navigation activity and we see that new nodes and links are displayed while we are browsing. So that's the end for the first scenario. And the second one is about in browser capture scenario. So we open up the Firefox network monitor component we do some web browsing activity. We save the navigation traffic data and then forward it to our web app for further analysis. Okay, so here it is. Now we can immerse into uh, the navigation path. So I'll be discussing uh, Further details hereafter, and find uh, find potentially uh, potential data access patterns. So back to the slides. 
uh, from our experiments, we derive two sets of observations. The first one is about network traffic capture techniques. Uh, evaluation is uh, summarized in the table available on the right side of the display. But in short, uh, we'll say that the live packet capture scenario is easy to set up, but offers low tracking details whenever the navigation uh, traffic data is encrypted. And conversely, the um, in web browser uh, capture is uh, with a full extension of uh, details that we may expect for uh, analysis of the navigation pass, but however, uh, requires a high uh, user involvement in the data collection process. So the second aspect is about data exploration. And here we observe that uh, 3D rendering with a force layout uh, specialization enable us to easily immerse into the navigation path and also uh, identify access patterns as special structures uh, from our ex experiment here again. We found three prevalent structures uh, which names are written below. So now, uh, assuming that you'd like to test our uh, setup, uh, its installation is uh, quite fast and straightforward. Uh, first, get access to our public uh, code repository and clone the project. Two, uh, install the tool set and its dependencies. Then three, uh, call on the data collection process. So here, the command line is an, uh, an example of the live packet uh, scenario. And four, call on the uh, web application and connect to the graph stream for further analysis. So now wrapping up on the presentation, uh, we were aiming at uh, studying the form of web navigation traces, uh, combining user actions and uh, network infrastructure details. So for this, we used uh, user-sided data collection, graph streaming, graph structure, and also 3D rendering. Uh, if you'd like to get some uh, more details about our approach, our methodology, evaluation, and direction for future work, please refer to the papers that is uh, uh, now public. And also, if you'd like to test, but even more, we'd like to contribute to our project, uh, please feel free to uh, get access to our code repository and uh, why not uh, make this happen as a web extension or add a semantic web serialization feature or even more advanced um, algorithms such as uh, graph isomorphism for comparing uh, access patterns to some graph structure database or doing some topos analysis. So here, uh, get access and extend it. Uh, that would be nice. So thank you for your attention. That's all for now. Uh, I hope you found this interesting work and I'm available now for answering your questions. Thank you, Lionel, for this uh, uh, very good presentation of, of the paper. Um, again, waiting maybe for people to uh, come into the queue for, to, to ask questions. I wonder, are there cases where you found the 3D view of the data particularly illuminating about a set of browsing sessions where you could discover patterns that would otherwise have been hard to spot in a 2D rendering? Yes, in fact, um, the three named patterns that are here on the lower left of the side, uh, display are, well, the names are from us, from our uh, own insight of the, of the, um, of the data. Uh, what we've seen is that, in fact, it's not the 3D visualization per itself uh, for discovering uh, the structure patterns, because we think that uh, mathematical tools can uh, help to find the structures themselves. However, um, mathematical tools often just uh, expose uh, some uh, metric that is not easy to understand. And with our visualization a priori, uh, studying the patterns, it seems more easy to map uh, these uh, data access patterns to real infrastructures, uh, such as what we call uh, various URLs from same server, which means that uh, some user uh, or well, some uh, web app, uh, page asks many uh, resources from the same server, or also from content delivery platform, where we find that uh, the first uh, 
access to some web page uh, entails requesting uh, resources from uh, varied uh, uh, platforms uh, within the content delivery platform. So this kind of uh, patterns is uh, easily revealed, uh, whereas it could have been uh, uh, hidden within a matrix, uh, well, numerical uh, matrix uh, from, uh, from uh, mathematical algorithms. Thanks. Uh, Pierre-Antoine, do you want to raise your question? Yes, thanks. Um, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Thank you for the presentation. I was wondering, so uh, I, I understand you're capturing the, the URLs for each, uh, for each uh, query response exchange. Are you capturing other information in particular? M my own interest is in the different content types that I exchange. Is it something that your system is capturing? Yes, um, uh, from the live packet capture, uh, of course, we are mostly uh, getting uh, IP addresses, uh, which are very poor, which is very poor for uh, our uh, exploration purpose. Uh, from the in-web browser capture, of course, we are getting more details, such as uh, the URL itself. So we can relate the URL to the server, the hosting server itself. We are also capturing uh, additional features, such as um, um, what is the intent from the users? Uh, that is, what is, uh, is it a click or a follow link, follow the link, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we can uh, potentially derive intentional models and map this to, uh, to why is the user moving this way into the, into the, the web resources. Uh, this is, the minimal uh, set of uh, indicators well, that we've chosen to, to take account for. Also, of course, we've also added uh, some kind of uh, timestamp and uh, uh, username to pinpoint what are the, the timeline, what is the timeline for getting access into the, into the web. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Any last question for Lionel? So this is one question that came up uh, in the reviews. Um, did you get any like practical insights? Like, did you learn anything by looking at this um, apart from having you know clusters and graphs and uh, interconnected balls? Um, did you did you see any new patterns that you were not expecting um, by throwing, for example, your uh, browsing history at it or um, by just looking at what other people have uh, have come up with. Um, it seems like um, there's a lot of potential, but um, the like the actual analysis step of what what can this be um, like used for in the sense of uh, what insights can this can this uh, reveal? Um, the, the paper didn't mention anything yet. so maybe by now um, is there any new information that you could share? Um. Yes, this is left for future work indeed. Uh, our point here is that uh, we've not tested this, or compared this uh, with other um, traffic traces or any other um, graph structure database, um, mainly because we don't have any attend. And this is why uh, we left this as a future work and currently see our uh, experiments and tool set as an enabler for, uh, for more. Uh, what we expect to is that uh, at first to add some uh, semantic web uh, features to this uh, tool set uh, for making use of uh, models that are uh, referenced to uh, in our paper uh, for reasoning on the network topology structures themselves and also about uh, the network traffic itself uh, in regard to uh, what is the protocol used and uh, in which case this kind of protocol correspond or not to some uh, uh, legitimate or to some attack, uh, cyber security attack or whatever. But sorry for that, but yet this is uh, left in the future work because of missing data for, uh, for, for going further on. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Hello everyone, welcome to our presentation. 
My name is Shachaf and I'm going to talk about how we at Booking.com built a voice assistant using mainly repurposed models. This will be the agenda. I will start by reviewing the, the product, the voice assistant, uh, what users actually use it for and also what it looks like now that it's built. Uh, we'll then try to go in depth into the, the pipeline of models that we have in the background operating in order to make the voice assistant work. Then I will list uh, the results, what we as a company actually achieved by uh, developing this voice assistant. And in the end, I will discuss the working philosophy behind the decisions that we made along the way and why we think this is an actually important subject to discuss. Now, what do users actually want to do when they open the voice assistant? So a few examples. They might be searching for a flight, which is another uh, service that we provide. Uh, if they have uh, an active booking, they might want to check what's the status of the booking, if it's, it was canceled or if there's something changed, which is uh, very important, especially nowadays in COVID times, when users meet change and uncertainty uh, in their daily lives. Um, there are, uh, of course, other examples, but the main uh, use case for uh, the voice assistant is still the basic use case of the platform, which is searching for an accommodation and booking an accommodation. Um, the product that we developed looked something like this. Uh, when you land in one of our mobile apps, you get this um, microphone button. When you push it, you have this UI popping up, transcribing whatever you are saying in real time. Uh, then if the voice assistant is quite certain about what you are trying to do, for example, in this case, uh, you are searching for hotels in California and you want to for only once with pool, it will apply an action and get you to a page that has whatever it is you need. So for example, in here, this is a list of hotels in California with the filter for pool uh, applied. Now, when reviewing the voice assistant uh, in its simplistic form, we have an input of waveform, which is how the uh, user utterance is re registered and forwarded into our system. And on the output side, we have some action that the app will want to, to apply. For example, searching for hotels in California. Anything in between is very use case specific. I will discuss exactly what we did in, uh, in our domain, which is the travel or the accommodation domain. Um, but you can imagine that if you are developing a psychotherapy bot or a psychotherapy assistant, you might want to add some sentiment analysis to, to the mix in between to try and understand the feelings or the, the mindset of your user. But going back into our own domain, uh, we have the waveform. It goes through a voice to text system, which is the first model we use to get some kind of transcription. Now, this transcription might be in any uh, language we, we service. Um, and a little bit jumping the, the gun, I, I tell you that the, uh, the models that we have downstream are all trained on English. So um, it was our decision to use some kind of machine translation in between. So from a transcription in any, any language, we transform into English. Then we apply named entity recognition, which is a very common uh, NLP task. On top of that, we have named entity resolution, which is actually mapping the named entities that we recognized into a specific ID that we have within our database. Then after we have the entities resolved, we go to text classification, uh, basically deciding what is the intent of the user. Is it uh, the, the command that he, the user uttered? Is it about search? Is it about uh, customer service? Is it something completely different? And then when we are quite certain about the intent of the user, we apply some business rules and uh, this allows the, uh, the app to apply the action that we, uh, that we need. For the entire pipeline of machine learning models that I uh, just discussed, for each of the models, there is a point of decision in our process when we had to decide 
do we want it to happen really fast or do we want it to be very accurate and very specific to our needs? And we listed a few options in, the, in this slide, uh, ranging between in-house development, which means you actually take data scientists or engineers to build a very specific model uh, to your needs, uh, which might uh, result in a very accurate model, but it will also take uh, quite a long time. It might take a, lot, a long time. And on the other extreme, we have third-party vendors, which uh, are available immediately. You, you just pay them and you get the, the results. But the, re the, the results of their models might not fit your needs exactly. And customization might be limited. On top of this uh, time versus specificity, uh, consideration there are other things to take into account when we're deciding how to do things for example do you have the data available in order to train the, the models because to get uh, a results from a third party you don't need to supply them with uh, with data on the other hand if you want to develop a, something in-house you must have the data available for it also workforce speci specialization so, for example, not all data scientists know how to work with NLP tasks. And trying to build something in-house might prove to be difficult if you don't have the proper experience for that. Uh, last but not least, the time to market. So whenever you develop a product, and in our case, the voice assistant, you don't really know how it will sit with the different markets. Will people actually use it? how beneficial it is to, to create it. So you want to make the time to market as short as possible to allow testing within the market itself, within the users, uh, how they respond to, the, to this new thing that you are developing. So for example, the voice to text model, uh, I will list the data that we had, the data that we used and the models that we used for each of the tasks. And for, for voice to text, um, we try to settle the chicken or egg problem that we had where you don't have data coming from your product before you release your product by looking at adjacent domain. So our um, thought line was that if we, uh, we have a specific language within the travel or accommodation domain, it might be beneficial to train a model on it and then later it will uh, just fit better than a general purpose model with our voice commands. So we collected this uh, data and then we had two models to, to compare. One is a third uh, party vendor and one is Caldi, uh, which is a voice to text framework that allows you to train some pre-trained models. You, you're, you can tweak them and uh, improve the results. And I will show the comparison between the two in a second, but after we released the product, we were able to collect actual in-domain data and then go back and compare the two once again. So the results, when looking at the conversations uh, domain, which is the adjacent domain, we see that the third party vendor does better than the Caldi framework, the model that we were able to, to tweak uh, as much as we, as we could. Um, the, percent, the numbers here are word error rates, and the lower the better. So when actually releasing the product, we use the third-party vendor. Then, uh, when after collecting the, the commands uh, from the actual uh, product, we saw a shift where uh, the, the open source uh, framework actually did better than the third-party vendor. So this is a switch that we, that we can make in order to improve the results. We were able to dig a little bit uh, deeper and we saw that there are very specific words that account for a lot of the error that uh, arises from uh, one or the, or the other uh, in app commands. So the third party vendor was not able to tweak into these very domain specific words, um, which we could actually tweak Caldi to, to account for. So the next part in the pipeline is machine translation, where we actually only had one model, a model that was developed within booking.com by a different team and was trained on the travel domain. And the data that we had is uh, collected only post hoc and tested uh, qualitatively rather than uh, quantitatively. So for example, looking at one third party vendor that we glimpsed at, 
uh, during the decision making, uh, we can see that this uh, sentence is translated quite well. I, I can understand the intent and I can understand the different uh, entities within the, the sentence when I look at the English form and I have to believe that it's the same in, in Italian. Um, but this is a well-formed sentence. When looking at fragments of sentences, which is something that is very common in voice commands, we see something different. For example, Madonna D is translated in general language into Holy Mother, um, which is, of course, if we feed it into our downstream tasks, we, it doesn't make any sense. On the other hand, if we use the in-house developed uh, model, it just keeps the, the same form. So then we get Madonna D and we can assume it's uh, Campiglio, which is somewhere in Italy. Another example, uh, Punta Prosciutto. Uh, it's not about uh, the delicacy. It is an actual place in Italy. So just qualitatively looking at these uh, pieces of information, we were able to decide to go with the in-house um, uh, machine translation model. Named Entity Resolution, this is actually a very, very specific task. As I said, it, re it re revolves around matching some named entity to an ID that you have in your uh, database. In our case, it's destinations mostly. And we, we were lucky to have something already developed uh, in-house. And we, again, tested it qualitatively. And we saw that it uh, works quite well. Last but not least is the task of text classification. So in this case, we were able to uh, compose a model using some simple rules that rely on the output of two different models. One is uh, the chatbot that we talked and discussed uh, before. They had some supporting information about the intent to book something. And also a different uh, model that was uh, built to map free text uh, queries to customer service uh, questions. Um, once again, we were only able to uh, collect data after the fact, after we released the, the product. And after that, we were able to construct another model um, using the Spacey framework and uh, to compare the, the two options that we, that we have in hand. Uh, the composite model looks like this, and we won't go through the, the whole uh, the whole logic. But basically, we start by deciding if the, this it's something about booking. If it's not, we uh, go to this part where we ask whether or not it is a customer service intent. And if it's not, we applied some uh, statistics on just keyword search. Uh, once again, asking if it is a customer service uh, task. And if no, then we ask the user what he actually intended to say. If yes, in each of these stars, we actually apply an action to the, um, to the, to the app. So comparing the two, we have uh, Spacey and Composite. Uh, precision and recall from uh, the two different models uh, for three different intents that we have in our bank. And we can see that it's quite sporadic. So it's difficult to know exactly which model is better for uh, which use case. However, when you take the two models and you compare the two using uh, rigorous A-B testing, we do find that Spacey does a little bit better in some of the tasks. Now, in terms of results, so uh, we went from not having a product, not having a voice assistant, to having a voice assistant within four months. We assume that if we had to develop the entire pipeline by ourselves, it would take more than two years, given the workforce, the specialization, etc. cetera. Uh, using A-B testing, we showed that there is improvement in conversion when, uh, when showing the voice assistant to the users and also a reduction in human handle tickets. So uh, users actually find whatever it is they're looking for, whether it's uh, searching for accommodation or asking for help without consulting humans in the process. So the philosophy behind our uh, uh, decision-making is make it work, only then make it better. Because time to market and actually presenting your uh, users with the product 
is key to understand what they need and also key to to unravel this uh, chicken or egg problem and other things as well when using other people's models you use their expertise you use their hard work and if you eventually can use their work just by writing a few lines of codes uh, you definitely should so thank you all for listening and you can open the app yourself and go try it and have a good day. So thanks. I think that was a very good uh, and very well illustrated summary of, of the paper. Uh, again, I'll let people uh, queue or raise questions in the chat, but I, I'll start with uh, one of my one of my own for for you, Gail. Um, so uh, I thought it was really interesting to see what in practice you need to go through when making uh, design decisions for uh, applying machine learning to the problem space. Uh, and the solution you found here, uh, I think based on a, a number of interesting heuristics, uh, apparently worked quite well to the particular use case. Do you have a sense of whether that pattern is one that you would apply more generally speaking in your future uh, uh, product and projects in that space? Or was that really specific to the particular constraints in which you were operating for, for this product? Yeah, so uh, I think that the, the, the main things are, are really common for, for uh, like any other product because uh, like again, imagine that we were starting from the beginning to uh, train a, a machine learning model to detect intent, but we still don't have the data. We don't know what people are tending to say. So one of the, uh, the key points that, that Chahaf mentioned and was, it was also super important to us was that we wanted to, to generate some kind of POC to start. It, it lets you gather data. It lets you understand whether you actually, I mean, sometimes you think that people want to do X or tend to do Y, but it's not like the reality. And like in booking, we are really data driven. So everything should be based on data and things that you collect from, the, uh, from, from your actual users. So yeah, the motivation was to, to start with something that works uh, like, you know, decent, it's probably not the best product. You can improve each one of the, of the elements of the sub elements of the product. Uh, but if it, if it works like uh, uh, fine with reasonable results, then, then it, it just lets you understand what you need to improve. Because uh, yeah, as, as Shahaf mentioned, it, at the beginning, it seemed that the, the voice to text of the um, third party vendor was um, like less uh, good than the, the one that, that we found as uh, open source. But at the end, if, if you're looking at the end product, Let's, let's, uh, we assume that some of the words that he missed just were irrelevant for the classification, for example. So like only after you have something that is running, you, you can gather more, da more data and more insights about what do you need to improve. So yeah, I think that the, I mean, the, the, the key uh, uh, things that we took from, from this journey, let's say, is yeah, first to start with something together, like a real data from your users. Don't try to do anything by yourself. If it's, again, if you have something ready and it's, in, uh, it's working, uh, um, yeah, it has like a decent performance, like don't try to build it yourself. Even that it feels, you know, usually for us developers, data scientists, it just feel more sexy. Like, no, I'm, I don't want to use something that someone already did, yeah? Like what, what they are paying me for, I want to do it myself. So usually it's not the, the best decision, decision, at least not at the at first stage. And yeah, we just took several things that people built within Booking. We took like a third party vendor service and, and we built a machine learning AI product without even, let's say, having any uh, um, machine learning resource. So I think in terms of bringing such products, it's amazing. And yeah, at the end, when you have uh, uh, AB infrastructure and AB testing infrastructure, you can always test if you want to replace one part of it and if it improves like the whole product because sometimes again a model that classify better or voice to text uh, um, um, part that, that do like that have better performance don't really uh, improve the performance of the whole product so it's really something that you need to a b test um yeah make it work make it better make it best thanks thanks a lot uh 
Any question from the room or? Um, if not, I have another one. I'm happy to go with it. So um, when I, I guess part of the space you've been exploring is uh, customizing existing models uh, to better fit uh, the space in which you run them. Uh, I wonder if there is any standard approach to this, and if not, uh, whether there should be a way for uh, both open source and uh, uh, proprietary vendor models to provide easier way to customize uh, the models to this particular set of uh, use cases, in this case, vocabulary that uh, you're dealing with? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm not sure about like, if there is a standard or no, we are, it's something that, that we are doing even now, like in, in different products. So, and it's also like really depends on, on the model. I mean, how it built, how, like, how do you, do you have all the resources? If it's not always like really easy to customize a, a pre-trained model. Um, but yeah, for some of the models, if you just like collect the data set that is uh, specific to your domain, uh, for example, for booking again, the, a lot of data set that, that talks about intent of the user or talks about uh, uh, searches that the user actually did, um, then yeah, you can you can just like retrain a model with with those examples, and it uh, usually yeah, it will just improve the performance of the model. Um, yeah, it, it's not always easy. Um, it really depends on the, the resources and like on the on the model uh, core, like how the model is actually built. Uh, but we are doing it right now for for vision, like for models that are on images, and um, yeah. So in the, in this use case, we we try to retrain a model that the other team uh, actually built. Um, I'm not sure how it it ended, but like at the end, uh, the product ran quite well with uh, with all the uh, parts. Thanks. So, I mean, I, I guess at least one lesson for me is that uh, there is this notion of machine learning engineering, which isn't about building models, but assembling them and connecting them one with another, that uh, I think your paper is really making a very interesting contribution to understanding what are the trade-offs that you need to, co to consider when uh, when Taking that way, I mean, uh, obviously machine learning is very popular, plenty of people want to use it, but uh, it's one thing to want, and it's another thing to actually put it in practice. And again, I think your paper did a yeah. really good job at looking at this. Yeah, so it's, it's exactly the, the position I'm personally taking now, because yeah, the, there's always a gap between like the theory. So there is like a model that is running, it, get, it gets, you know, I mean, gives you a good result, but, but then there is the product and it, there's always like a gap in between. And uh, yeah, I think that again, the ability to, to take something from theory and to make it, uh, to actually generate a product from it. So it, it really, yeah. I mean, yeah, good uh, uh, to, to get, uh, take a good decisions like in the road, it's probably super important to the, uh, to the work of the whole team. Um, yeah, it was an interesting journey. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks a lot, and uh, please extend our, our thanks to, to your colleagues as well for, for the, mm -hmm. the work and the presentation. Uh, and yes, indeed, clapping virtually. Um, I believe we now have a 15 minutes, 15 minutes break before we reconvene for the three next uh, presentation. The second part of the session will be chaired by uh, Thomas, but uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, thank you all for having joined us uh, for this first session, and I hope to see many of you 15 minutes from now. Super, thanks, Tom. And I think interestingly enough, it was at an, uh, a worldwide web conference that we met, as they were still called back back then. Actually, I think it's 10 years ago, must have been 2012. Today I'll talk indeed about decentralized app development. And of course, decentralization is a flag that covers many different kinds of loads. Um, when I say decentralized, I mean the following. I'm talking about Solid. I'll tell you, tell you a bit about Solid first um, before we go into challenges of, of decentralized development on top of systems like Solid. And then I'll go into the developer experience. 
So let's have a look at the salt ecosystem, which is the kind of decentralization that I'm talking about. Because of course, lately we have seen quite some developments in the decentralization, notably with uh, the, block the blockchain stack. Um, they're also called Web3, but they're fundamentally different from, from what we're doing here. Um, the goal with Solid is to, to separate data from applications. Because now we live in a very platform-driven web where you know, if you want to build something, you need to get people's data on, on your site as well. So every single app, every single service starts with harvesting data to then provide the service after that. And this is centralized in the sense that we have come to depend on a handful of platforms in order to perform interactions on the web. Let's say if you want to exchange a document, well, we depend on Google or Microsoft to have that kind of exchange. And just like that, there's quite some, some dependencies. So this is about removing those central dependencies from the web, in this case, by separating data from apps. So indeed, um, if we have access to data, we can choose the app. So if I'm sharing an Office 365 document with you because I've stored my data with Microsoft, you cannot edit it with Google Docs. Also, the opposite is true. Um, if we really want to use um, Google Docs, that we cannot store our documents on Dropbox or with Microsoft and so on. So this tight coupling leads to the centralization that we have today. And within Solid, what we say is if we separate data from applications, then we create independent choices. People can choose their apps independently of where data is stored. And this leads to a very different kind of, of development, which is what I want to talk about today. And in essence, it's a bit like going back to desktop mode, you know, in the old days, I would put a document on a USB stick, I would give it to you, and you would use different software from the one that I had, and it would still all work together. So this is kind of what we're trying to do with the World Wide Web. Now, the central concept in all of this is called a personal data vault or a personal data pond. Let me quickly explain to you what this is. So the left-hand side is what we have today. This is us people losing control over our data because all of the platforms that want to offer as a service need a copy of our data first. And this leads to many of the problems that you've undoubtedly heard about. But in addition to being bad for people, there's also very few companies who actually like this. Because if you're a small company or even a medium-sized company or startup, you have to collect the data first. It's expensive to collect it. It's a legal liability. Keeping it up to date is also not that easy. So apart from maybe a handful of really big companies, nobody really likes the data harvesting efforts that are going on today. It's quite a burden on app developers. Wouldn't it be simpler if, you know, when you start building an app, you could just build the app and not have to ask people about their data first? Well, uh, we introduced the concept of a personal data fall to do precisely this. The idea is quite simple. It's a virtual space that you have somewhere. And in that virtual space is all the data that you create yourself and all the data that others create about you. So instead of having to spread your data all across different companies and organizations, you store the data closer to you. And if somebody wants to provide you with a service, you can just bring your data to them. It makes it quite a bit easier um, for people to manage their data makes it also quite a bit easier for developers to innovate because they don't have a responsibility of collecting, of maintaining and, and updating the data and so on. Obviously, for privacy reasons, it should also be nice. Now, such a simple concept fundamentally changes how we build applications. I'm going to give a couple of, of examples that are in the social media world, but please, while I talk about social media, think about different use cases. Think about e-health, think about and resumes, think about retail, think about all different kinds of scenarios. But if we think about social media, let's think about how data flows today as a developer, right? If I want to build a view like this, typically today, all of the pieces of data I need to build this view, they would come from a single place. If this is a Facebook post, it would come from Facebook. If they're a Twitter post, and so on and so forth. Now, let's introduce this concept of a personal data if you all have a personal data for them, this is my social media post. Well, this profile picture is going to be stored in my personal data pod. The text is going to be stored in my personal data pod, and so is the photo um, that goes along with the text. Now, if any one of you comments on my post, well, this comment is yours. It's going to be stored in your personal data pod. 
If somebody reacts on your comment, well, that reaction is theirs, is gonna be stored in their personal data vault. And even a piece of data as small as a like, if somebody likes my post or your comment, well, that like is theirs, it's gonna be stored in their personal data vault. And what you see as developer is certainly that this kind of view could be built with data from dozens or hundreds of different kinds of data sources which requires a very different thinking about applications. Mm -hmm. Now, how does this fundamentally change the experience that people have? Well, again, let's look at the situation today, which is the left-hand side. Today, we have a famous walled gardens, the silos. Uh, simply said, I cannot easily share a Facebook picture with my LinkedIn colleagues. I have to either move the data or move the people. If I move the data, I lose control because my data is spread everywhere and I'm just making copies, right? If we have to move the people, then I'm, I'm advising those people to lose control over their data because they have to bring their data along as well. So not a very interesting um, world. It's also a world in which we have constant synchronization problems. If I accept an event on Facebook, well, then Doodle won't know about it and so on. So basically, we're 2022 and still we spend quite some time dragging data around between different systems, which is a job actually computers should be doing for us, that kind of synchronization. Now let's have a look at the right-hand side when we introduce those personal data pods. What you see on top is the same apps, right? the, the rectangles, they're all different applications, but the data has been pushed out into personal data pods. So the right-hand side is a world in which I can start with one application and continue with another. And there are no synchronization problems because there are no copies of the data. All the applications operate between the same data. Compared to today, where like every single app on your phone has its own storage, it's very hard to get across those boundaries. What's also interesting about the right-hand side is that it's a world in which you can choose your applications, I can choose mine, and still we can communicate with each other because the communication doesn't happen through the application, but it happens through the data. Very different world. So that kind of choice that is enabled is very good for, for people um, because who doesn't like choice? But also um, it's interesting for the companies and developers participating in this, um, which is a story that is not told often enough. Let's have a look again, left-hand side today. The competition we see today in many sectors is not based on who has the best app, who has the best product. It is based on who has the most data. It's a very boring competition that in many fields has already ended, like the winners are, are, are known, deal with it. But interestingly, it's a world in which people get a very simple to model experience. Well, again, let's simplify a bit. Everybody's using the Facebook app, but nobody really likes it. Right. This is because the Facebook app is built for the average user, which doesn't exist. Literally, grandmothers and granddaughters are using the same Facebook app, not because either of them are having a great experience. It's just a boring app. But if they want to talk to each other, this is a the thing they have to use. They have to use the same app, even if it doesn't work well, but it works well enough. No. And this is quite troublesome from an innovation perspective from two sides, actually. On the one hand, we see that the big companies don't innovate. Think about it. How has your LinkedIn feed fundamentally changed in the past 10 years? It has, right? So the big companies don't innovate for many reasons, but this um, average user problem um, being, being one of them, for instance, right? But even worse is that small companies who want to innovate cannot do this because they don't have the data. So if I have an idea to make a better LinkedIn or Facebook feed, well, too bad. I cannot launch my idea because I don't have the data that they have. So the world we have today is one in which interesting developments and exciting apps don't win because it's all about having data. Now let's have a look at the right-hand side, which is what happens when we separate data from storage. The right-hand side is a world in which grandmother and granddaughter can have each their own apps. Grandmother maybe has one with really big letters and colors she likes, and granddaughter has something more flashy. It doesn't really matter. The point is that they can still talk to each other because it happens through the data, all of the interaction. It does mean from a development perspective that we have niches again, like 
can we build something better than the Facebook app? Yes, we can, because we don't have the burden of the average user. We can build experiences for specific people, if only we can rely on data that is stored somewhere else. The same thing can happen on the, on the storage provider market. There can be competitions as well between different storage providers based on price, quality of service, anything you might want to choose. And this is a much more interesting competition because you don't have to build the platform that works for everyone. You can actually build separate products where people can make independent choices. This is what makes it tick. So what this fundamentally changes actually is um, how, whole, how the whole of competition works. Because today, people building apps are by necessity forced to try to collect enough data to just keep up with customer demands. So what you see is that those trying to challenge the tech giants um, are currently the mode where they try to harvest more and more data just to collect as much as the big ones and preferably more. But this is a fallacy. There's no growth in this model. Because let's be honest, um, the growth that Facebook has seen in the past decade, they can never replicate. One, there's simply not enough people on the planet. Like they cannot triple or quadruple again. And also, the amount of data per person, they cannot collect much more because there's a legal ceiling, which they already are very close to flirting with, just to say it very um, softly. So harvesting more and more data to deliver a better service is not an option. Even if you could reach the level of the current giants, well, getting past them is going to be very hard just from a legal perspective. So what we say is that the future belongs not to those who harvest the most data, but to those who reuse data in the most intelligent way. And if you do this, there's going to be more data, not less. Simply said, think about supermarkets to take another example besides social media. Today, my supermarket knows already eh, what I have bought, what I am buying, and what I will buy. But what I really want to know is, what is he buying online and in other stores? Well, when I have personal data fault, I can say, you know what? I'm going to store data myself, and who wants to see all of the data that I've been doing elsewhere? And it's this kind of innovation that's really important to make that happen. So Solid in here is not a platform to replace others, but it's a set of standards such that we can build these kind of applications that separate um, data and service. The standards enable interoperability. Um, we also need a shift in mindset among app builders to build applications such way. But Solid is also a community of people that build um, such applications that build the standards and, and that drive them. So let me go a bit more deeply into the challenges that we have as a decentralized uh, technology. Hmm? Because if we're all going to store our own data, how can we connect it to other people's data? And how can applications share data without having too many prior agreements? And how can we integrate data from different sources, from different of such data pods? Because that's what's um, going to happen ultimately. Um, I see on chat, um, Ivan has an interesting question uh, about um, the danger of, 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 of the monopoly. Um, it's a complex answer, but, but, but let me maybe dive into it. Um, so key here is the use of, of standards, which I think is appropriate to, to mention in, in, in this setting specifically, where we're talking about W3C standards. Um, because just like, I can take a website and move it to a different hosting provider on a different technology stack. Huh? Um, I'll be able to do the same thing with a data pod. So standards um, guarantee basically that the data is, is always movable. Mm. Now, of course, how do we enforce such standards? And because on the web, many web servers voluntarily follow the HTTP spec, meaning you can just fetch documents and put them somewhere else. Um, this is an interesting matter. Um, here in Belgium, we're looking into um, regulation uh, to do this, basically. So the idea is that, look, anybody can be a pod provider, just like anybody can start a bank if you follow certain regulations, certain requirements. And one of the requirements for being a pod provider is that you follow the protocol. And if you follow the protocol, then the data is, um, is moving. So that's like the very, very quick um, five sentence uh, answer to the question. But, Maybe I should leave some space at the end so we can debate it a bit more. 
we'll do that. Um, I was talking about the challenges that we have uh, when we're decentralizing. Mm -hmm. So what it comes down to ultimately is that we're gonna use something called linked data so that we can have data that doesn't need to be in one location, but can make connections across different data vaults. For instance, here's a piece of data from my data pod, and this is me liking the web conference. The interesting bit is there's no like button on the homepage of, of the web conference, but I like it anyway, because it's my data. I can do what I want. And a like in this case is a link from my profile to somewhere else. So this is how I can link from my islands to data in another place. The other question is how are we gonna build applications on, on, on top of this? Well, those applications have to be trained to recognize certain shapes of data, for instance, right? So instead of having to recognize any bit of data, we can say, look, there's a complex knowledge graph stored in a pond, but if you're an application that shows likes, all you need to care about is data that looks like this. And a very interesting bit about linked data is data integration. How can we show the likes of, of many people and how do we combine them? Well, it would be hard to just concatenate piece of JSON, but with linked data, it's easy. Here's my like, here's a like that Tom might have made. We can just put the graphs together and it's really made for this kind of uh, decentralized data integration. Um, let me show you a couple of, of pictures on, on how we envisage decentralized application development, right? Because fundamentally the challenge for applications is that in, in some way they need access to data, to knowledge that's out there on the web. So what I'm gonna show you now is how we build applications for a single data source. And then I will try to generalize against how to build applications for multiple data sources. So conceptually, um, an application needs to deal with a knowledge graph that is so big that it does not fit into application memory. So what an application does, it will selectively grab some pieces of this data graph and then kind of pretend that it has the whole thing by only showing you a part. So it's kind of a view into a bigger data set. Now, how we solve this data for a single source is of course using an API. If all of this data fits on a single server, we put an API in front of it, let's say a JSON API, and we can just write a JSON application. It's as simple as that. Now the JSON API will, for instance, expose this mess of data through a set of documents. And then if we want to collect several pieces of data, we just do multiple requests. Now what has happened in development in order um, to optimize such kind of, of multiple requests is that we have invented um, query-like APIs, for instance, Instead of doing two requests to a JSON API, maybe can, I can do one single request to a GraphQL API. And underneath the covers, the GraphQL API will actually fetch data from different documents and send it to me. This is how we kind of build um, complex applications using query, right? Now let's retell this entire story, but instead assuming that data is spread across multiple places. Um, because then we need to do the same thing, create this virtual view of this big mess of, of data, but every server will have its own API. And in this case, it's gonna be a linked data API because we need data that can connect across the boundaries of a single server. Now, of course, the complexity is that there's not just one API for linked data, there's actually many different kinds of APIs. So our application might need to talk to different APIs. To make matters worse, every single server could expose the same data through different APIs. So it gets quite complex quickly. Now you could think, well, actually, why don't we apply the same GraphQL trick that we have done with single source data? Instead of making 15 requests, let's just go to one GraphQL API. Well, you would be right, but the problem is data is inherently spread across different servers here. So which server are you going to attach the API to? There is no server to do this. So the way we're thinking at the moment to create a developer experience uh, on such decentralized APIs is to actually put some query logic, maybe GraphQL logic on the client. So that way you can still develop your applications if you're building a JSON application against a single knowledge graph, whereas actually in practice, 
your interaction is translated to interactions to multiple different um, surfaces. But those kind of um, abstractions will be necessary if, if we think about decentralized web applications. Because what we're fundamentally doing is a transition from API-driven integrations to data-driven integrations. Mm -hmm. Today, as JavaScript developers, what we very often do is interface with, with APIs, and we do those interfaces manually. But if everybody, if every person in the world literally has their own personal knowledge graph, their own data pond, it's not going to scale. So we need to think about data integration. And the interesting bit is the salt ecosystem is starting to grow and developers are still wrapping their heads around how can we build these centralized applications? So they've got many challenges, but interestingly, a lot of them are complaining about API problems because Solid is a universal API, regardless of what kind of data format you have. So if we want to build these applications that are independent of web APIs that are offered, we need to start thinking about what kind of good clients abstractions exist to have this room to a decentralized web so that we don't have to code against every single API. So what we're looking at in this world world is this investment in um, reusable client development patterns where we can see, okay, even if data is distributed in different ways in the ecosystem, can we have a consistent abstraction where the application can pretend it's just accessing a big knowledge graph, or actually in practice, this knowledge graph is spread across multiple servers. I did have a detailed part about what a developer experience could look like, but probably in the interest of time, Tom, it's, it's best that we go to questions and interactions rather than me keeping on, on talking uh, out loud. Um, I think we are a little flexible, so um, time-wise, maybe if you want to just very quickly show people how, um, like maybe skip the process, maybe just show the, the final slide of how such an ex uh, example application could look like, maybe? Yeah, so I'll show you very concretely what I did. Um, it basically looks like, like this. Right? So here we've imagined an, an experience in, in React, for instance, right? which is, is often used these days for development. And we imagine things such as like user.firstname, user.friends.firstname, so kind of an expression language um, that can be used to retrieve data. Why an expression language? Well, React is on the only framework. We're going to need abstractions for different kind of frameworks. So we're looking for those reusable developer um, abstractions that are valid across different frameworks as well. Now, this is where it gets really cool for the uh, JavaScript geeks because these look like simple local JSON object traversals. But actually, remember, we're dealing with a complex knowledge graph. And we've made a complex of expression, such as user.name, user.friends, first name, or even give me the first name of my friend's friends. All the things are possible. What's also possible is saying something like, give me the URL of Ruben's blog. And you see that you can inject a whole URL into what looks like a local object. And this is where it, where it gets special. So what we've done here is we've created an abstraction that feels like a local object, but actually uses underneath the covers Java proxy to, um, to go to the web. Yeah, so it feels kind of local, but actually using proxy, we can implement lookups. So if you put the await keyword in front of data that uses that friend first name, your browser will actually go through the web and go to your friend's spots to fetch their first names and to give you back a list. So these kind of abstractions, I think, will be very important to help developers with the complexities of a decentralized landscape where data can uh, basically be everywhere. So to wrap up, I've told you about solid, data pods, decentralized data, the kind of challenges we're facing API-wise, and the kind of thinking we need to do to get into a developer experience. Let me wrap up here and maybe go into some of the questions that were coming from the audience. Thank you very much already. Um, we do have a question from Tobias Kefer. Um, Tobias, you wanna unmute? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, my question was, uh, so you were talking about the example of uh, my likes um, and so on, uh, or, or the, the likes of the person who has the pod, but if I'm really popular and want to count the likes that I received, then I have millions of followers and, and they give me millions of likes, do I have to do then millions of requests? Well, look at you. 
it's even worse because since everybody's storing their own likes, it's not guaranteed that you have permission to see it. Like I can maybe like something or dislike something and just tell my colleagues, but not even tell you about it. So on the open web, collecting all of the likes is an impossibility. Hmm? Um, so, so that is a starting point. So completeness is out of the question. Now, what could happen, of course, is a pingback mechanism, like where if I like something yep. from you, I sort of like a iPod, and I can say, by the way, Tobias, I really like what you've done. Here's a pingback to the URL. So you can have a counter, it could be cached of counters, or there could be services um, which kind of aggregate and, and verify likes, for instance. But the key is there's not going to be one platform that has all the likes. There might be different ones. Yeah, yes, so the question, I mean, that was a silly example. Uh, at the end, it boils down to if you have things that need to aggregation over a larger amount of data, be it over the million of sources or only a handful of sources, um, you were talking about aggregating services. Is there any works already in that area? Because you just said that's an that could be a solution. Are there any things that would that would work in the in the linked data in the linked data work seamlessly. So within the existing linked data world, I haven't come across such solutions, but these are things that we are developing as, as part of what Assault is doing. So because if you decentralize, caching is going to be the key, of course, to make it happen. So thinking about decentralized linked data caches, what do they look like and so on, these are ongoing questions. So, so the, these things are being built at the moment, but there's no off the shelf uh, thing ready, no indeed not. All right, looking forward to the solutions. Well, thank you. Um, up next is uh, Ivan, who has his hand up. Yeah. Um, nice to see you again, Ruben. I am not even know when we met the last time. Um, I come back to this question that I asked at the beginning. Um, and, and my question is not technical. I mean, I understand the standardization. I understand that, that you can move around the data. But you were referring to my grandmother and, and you know, her, her dead granddaughter, uh, who are not technical people necessarily. And so what I can foresee is that some of these data bought service providers will gather an inordinate amount of data, huge amount of data. And because they do a kind of a service and because they will not help you really to move out the data, you can reproduce the same kind of monopoly that let's say Facebook has. Uh, just the only thing, the only difference in inverted comma is that the only thing that I hold is your data and I don't provide a user interface to it, but your data is still very centralized with all the dangers that that, that gives. Absolutely agree. And I think maybe zooming out extremely, the bigger points um, here is that the technology is only the necessary condition to make any of this happen. With technology, we don't have anything, but with technology, we just have to bear minimum. So Solitus is, not mainly a technical exercise, it's a socioeconomic exercise, it's a legal exercise and so on. So we've got multidisciplinary teams looking at this. I'm just a computer science in, in, in this story, but- well, So am I. <laughs> <laughs> but like very concretely, so here in Belgium, yeah, Flanders, which is the top half of Belgium, um, our government has decided to give each of its 6 million citizens a data pod with solar technology. And these are questions they're looking into. Um, because like the, the comparison to banks I, I briefly made earlier is not too far-fetched in, in the sense that, I mean, banks also have people's assets and so on. What if, if they start going wrong? The answer that we have here in Europe is certification regulation. You know, banks have to follow certain standards, so are pod providers. Yeah? So the government is now creating the first pod provider themselves to set as an example, and then also find out, we're gonna have multiple of these, what kind of rules do, do they, they, they need to follow? Of course, the answer will be different in different parts of, of, of the world. But um, yes, ultimately, we need to look at this, this bigger picture and it's definitely not a technical challenge. Yeah, it's, um, but they're not unrelated to online banking, protecting people from phishing and, and so on. So, but that's for data instead of money. But, but point very well taken. And we're looking at it, this bigger picture for sure. So I have a question as well, and I'm not sure if it's a stupid question, so I still ask it. Um, so let's assume we have this one centralized thing in my data pod where all my information is stored, right? 
And then I use one application, which may be, let's say, the official Flanders government, uh, whatever public administration app. And I use another app, which is a stupid game that I just found interesting. And because I want to enter my high score, I also granted access to my data board, pod, not board, uh, pod. And um, because this random game, let's say, is made by someone who is not very good with security, all of a sudden has the ability to change, let's say, my name in my data pod. And all of a sudden, the Flanders government thinks um, I'm not called Tom anymore, but now I'm called uh, whatever, John Doe. Um, is this something that can realistically happen, or is this a completely stupid question and uh, all is solved with, I don't know, RDF versioning and we can just go back or different levels of access yeah. or like how, how would something like this be prevented? It's a couple of answers to this. I'll go through a couple of, of them quickly. So first, compartments, of course, like not all data is equal. To access my medical data, you need a much bigger clearance than you need for any other categories of data. Second is digital signatures, like yes, it's my pot, I can make my data whatever I want. However, the government will have a signed version of my data saying, look, we certify that your name is exactly this. And if you change it, you will make the signature. And so in this case, there's also an authority for this kind of data. So you cannot just change it in anything you want without breaking the, the, the seal on it. Um, yeah. And the other option is also certification of application providers. If you want to change basic data, well, the government would like to have a talk with you to see if you need to improve things. Ah, that's good to hear. And um, follow up question maybe um, again on names. And we all know that, that names are hard um, when you go to different cultures. Um, so let's say one application just has one name field that has anything that can be Tom, it can be Tom, Michael, whatever, uh, Jordan, or it can be um, first name, middle name, or it can be just Chinese name, which doesn't even have a concept of uh, first name, last name, family name, surname, surname whatever. Um, so how would all these different name use cases alone be, be clarified? I know there probably are RDF standards for all of them, but um, like, would the data pod then um, somehow, um, what, what's the word, um, in a superfluous manner have to store your name representation in all different formats? Or how would this work in practice when you really think of making this your centralized data pod that all applications on the world theoretically could access? So the very honest answer is that um, we have an open technology challenge for specifically the problem that, that, that you mentioned. Um, so the good news is that as part of this emergence of thing here in Belgium, there's quite some funding available to work on problems such as this one. And it's a very concrete one on, on, on my list. Um, long story short, for this specific case, I think there will be an official name and also the, what would you like to be called? Uh, so, so there could be a field like this, but the whole, if then situation, eh, we should strive for not having every single application and code whole logic, like I should pick this or that and so on. There should be separate data layer, but the application says, look, I want a thing that is just for greeting the user. How you got it, I don't care. Just give me what I should call the user. And the logic for finding what it is for this particular version can be separate from the application itself, such that it's consistent and developers don't have to know everything all the time. Thank you for the transparency and for the link as well. Um, do we have any other audience questions or something that someone came up now spontaneously? Um, uh, I think we, we are still have... two, yeah, two people in the queue. Yeah, right. We, we still have, I think, nine minutes left now. Um, so let's make use of this time. Um, where's the queue? I don't see the queue. Is it uh, uh, raise hands on the participant list? Uh, and I'm the first one, so I guess I'll act myself. Um, yes, thanks for the presentation, Robin. Uh, so I understand that data pods are expected to host standardized data formats, uh, presumably based on uh, existing vocabularies and ontologies. But I can also imagine that many, if not most, applications have uh, data needs that aren't standardized, uh, either yet or maybe will never be standardized because it's such a micro use case that they don't really need standardization. How, how do you expect that would be handled in the solid uh, framework? So when it comes to data, there's fundamentally two assumptions you can make. Assumption one is there will be a world in which everybody will agree on how to model things. Assumption two is there will never be 
So linked data technologies are fundamentally created from the perspective that people will never agree. They will disagree. So we have to prepare to do post-factum um, agreements. Now, I'm not saying that the technology covers everything and is perfect, but the idea should be baked into the software and the modeling that there will be disagreements, that different people will name different fields differently. Now, the good news is that there's only, agreements can be layered in the sense that there's only a small set of things we should all agree on. Like just simply said, maybe, you know, what is a name for the user? Uh, um, what, what is um, a, a label for something? What is authorship? Like maybe just a set of, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 labels we all need to agree on. But the more specific we go, let's say to uh, a shoe size or a car manufacturer and so on, the smaller the group is that needs the agreement. Yeah? So that ultimately somebody has such an esoteric use case that there's only one person who needs to know, right? But so it's being layered and the fact that we can agree after modeling data is, 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 is a core value of things. Of course, this is all very hand-waving in the sense that, yeah, technology will solve it, but we know it doesn't. Um, because one of the, the things that we're working on is the assumption that linked data will cut it. And I've, I've spent quite some time in a semantic web community like, like, like some of you also have. And I think an issue or like a risk is that many of these technologies work in a basement. Like if we have a billion triples, a billion pieces of, of facts in, in our basement, it all works. It, we can just do high performance reasoning and alignment and it all seems to work. However, the same algorithms break down if you just give them 10, triple, uh, 10 simple triples in a browser um, because that's very messy data, right? So I think part of the whole mission here is to make sure that whatever has worked in our basements for the past 20 years also works for the real web. And that's quite a challenge. At the same time, I think it's also kind of test that we need because if that doesn't work, I think we, we should go back to JSON and schemas because the big promise of linked data is that we can do all these things and transformations has never been really put to the test on, on the public web. So finding these things out is, is a big part of, of my, my challenge list. So I've posted a challenge about greeting a user by the preferred name. Well, there's many more challenges not like these. So the way I envisage it is indeed like, instead of going from API integration problems, then we go to data integration problems with the assumption that data integration problems will ultimately be easier to fix than API integration problems. But there's still a massive burden of proof that we have on there. And if none of this works, I think it's going back to shapes and schemas and hard agreements on how things work. But as we all know, agreements are very slow. So this would, would limit to a kind of use cases that we can tackle. And so to wrap up my, my rant, there is a positive, uh, positive sentiment towards what we could do with linked data technologies, but many of the assumptions are untested and I have a kind of a no or never feeling like either we deliver on data integration promise or we should go somewhere else. Thanks, so ju just to make sure I get this right, I guess one of the hypotheses is that having the common linked data framework for uh, data description lowers the cost of integration compared to JSON API, which is a much mm -hmm. broader set of expressive uh, space. Yeah, exactly. And the idea of a data vault is not new. Like there's many projects out there, but what all the other projects do is first, they're not doing standards, they're more platforms. So that sets a lot apart. But second, they focus on specific use cases. They do people, cars, shoes, whatever. And this allows them to get started really fast because they just got fixed data models. But as we all know, the moment it grows bigger, agreement is very hard to scale. So the assumption we make is like, well, let's not try to go for agreements. Let's go for, let's trust that the data can be transformed when it's needed. But the burden of proof is still upon us. So that's definitely, that's a major assumption on the technology level. Thanks. We have one more question from Pian Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Ruben, for a uh, nice presentation. More, more of a remark than a question, actually, uh, following on, on uh, the discussion initiated by Ivan on the, uh, well, the practical uh, uh, likelihood of, of uh, people moving their data from, uh, from one pod provider to another and, and the risk of monopoly. Uh, we, are, we are witnessing uh, at th this very time 
uh, how how some events can can uh, prompt people to move away from big platforms. Uh, I'm thinking of Twitter. Uh, so this kind of thing can happen. I can remember my in my parents in law considering very seriously that didn't happen, but considering very seriously moving away from WhatsApp some time ago when Facebook changed their uh their, their their user policy so th those kind of things may happen but th there was there was a nice uh, paper in the guardian which i'm pasting here uh, um, questioning the the arguments about the, the the whole free speech and also about the the the, the whole free speech argument by, by by elon musk and also the the freedom of choice that theoretically people have to leave twitter if they don't like it today they don't have that choice because leaving twitter means as you said you need to move all your data or, or move all the people and i think a good uh, a good point in this decoupling is that it, it re uh, re-empowers people to choose they can if really they have the motivation to change their pod provider, they don't have to lose their contacts, lose, lose their network uh, with this. And so, yes, there are risks, but but I think it it it, it mitigates some of the problems that we have today with uh, with the centralized architectures. Just my two cents. <laughs> no, cool, thanks. Um, and I definitely follow just that argument. Like, I mean. Imagine if it will if it would one day be as easy as changing phone providers, for instance. You know, back in the days when I changed phone provider, I needed to change my number. No one, no one can, can do it without. Like, if we could achieve that level of, of frictionless moves, but it's a big if. But that would be the idealistic goal, yeah. All right, I think we're almost out of time. Um, we still have enough time to thank Ruben. Um, so let's do what we did before. Um, let's come you and just give Ruben a big round of applause. Thank you very much for agreeing to this. Uh, thank you very much. Very welcome. Thank you. So normally, when I pr do such presentations, I've got a lot of uh, music gear with me, my guitar, some uh, MIDI controllers, keyboard, and so on. So this time it will be uh, remote, so I will uh, rely on uh, pre-recorded video or online demos. Uh, so um, indeed, I'm going to talk about Web Audio Modules 2.0, that is uh, an open standard for Web Audio plugins, and I will explain uh, what all this thing means. It's in an ongoing work that started in 2015 and uh, as the the presentation uh, I've got only 15 minutes uh, I will uh, um, recommend to look for the to the previous presentations I, I, I gave uh, I am Michel Buffa a professor researcher at University Côte d'Azur in the south of France near the city of Nice um, I made several presentations with my uh, famous uh, stick guitar as you can see on the bottom right if you click on it this is a video where, where I am playing guitar using Web Audio uh, uh, applications. I am a member of the WeMix Research Group, common to INRIA and uh, I3S Lab from French CNRS, located in Sofia Antipolis. And I am the AC rep of my university uh, for the W3C. And uh, the consequence is that I've been participating uh, to multiple uh, web, uh, working groups and uh, I am now uh, quite active with the Web Audio Working Group uh, that I joined uh, since uh, 2014. So we meet, we meet each week and uh, we are working actively on Web Audio version 2. The first one has been uh, RFC in uh, 2018. So with, um, I'm working with a member uh, of the one two group so it's uh, one of my phd students some researchers or, or academic people uh, stefan les from the gram laboratory in lyon and um, also independent developers from the music industry professional developers uh, some of them created uh, Ampet studio that is uh, one of the, the few digital audio workstation uh, online di digital audio workstation available and some of them started to work uh, on um, on a plugin standard. So we all met. So now all the people interested by this topic are working together. And this is what I'm going to present. So two years ago, this is the, the main uh, slide from my presentation. So I will uh, recommend you to, to to go there to see where we are coming from. And just as a teaser, uh, just uh
So all the guitar processing is done in real time by a web app, uh, guitar amplifier simulator, some audio effects, and uh, this has been played by a professional uh, guitarist. And um, my lab is uh, commercializing some uh, some plugins right now uh, that are available in uh, some commercial applications. So uh, that was just to say that with web audio you can do commercial applications now. Uh, it works. So a uh, little um, uh, reminder about the music, the computer music landscape. It's mainly, mainly native applications today, and it's ruled by uh, four vendors that are making so-called digital audio workstation, or DOS. Uh, and th these are huge software, very complex, that are used to record uh, songs and make records in studio or at home. And uh, the, the most well-known are Cubase, Logic Pro by Apple, Ableton, Pro Tools, and things like that. So uh, on, the top, uh, on the top right, you can see uh, Logic Audio with some uh, tracks so that you can record using a MIDI keyboard or using a microphone or by plugging an instrument uh, with a sound card. And then uh, you can record real time and you can use plugins to process the sound. Uh, so you can tweak the different uh, parameters after you record it. What you record is called a dry sound, and then you can tweak it. So you can see Guitar Rig, that is a, a plugin for uh, uh, simulating guitar effects and guitar amplifiers. And on the bottom right, you got a set of available plugins. You can have the famous auto-tune for singing and so on. So the market is articulated around DAOs, digital audio workstation that are host for plugins. And there are literally thousands of plugins developed, uh, mostly in CC++ by developers. And for the, 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 the anecdotes, there are four different competing non-compatible formats for uh, uh, audio plugins in the native world. Let's go back to the web platform. So Web Audio is an API that is a very, at a very low level. So that means that with this API in JavaScript, you can assemble nodes that will uh, make a audio graph and the sound is coming, flowing from left to right, where destination node is the speakers or it might be a web socket or whatever. And uh, you you can have source node. Here I've got a source node that is playing an audio buffer. And then you can have different nodes for adjusting the volume, the frequencies, making filters, delaying the sound. So if I click here, I've got an online demo. Okay, when I stop playing it, you could hear tuk 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 tuk. This is a delay effect. And by tweaking some parameters of this node, you can uh, change the behavior of this effect. So uh, obviously, this is a, a low-level application compared to uh, the, the small uh, uh, UIs you can see here with knobs, sliders, and, uh, and uh, ni nice widgets. So in 2022, we have four commercial online DOS made with web audio. One is Soundtrap, one is Ampet Studio, one is Foundation, and one is BandLab. So maybe there are others, but these ones are ruling the market. Soundtrap belongs to Spotify, and Ampet Studio belongs to NetEase Music, that is the, spot, the Chinese Spotify, seven times bigger. So most development started in 2015. Some of them have some mobile versions. Some of them are built uh, using very low level code and a special uh, web audio node called an audio worklet, where you're just taking the input, the input uh, audio samples, you tweak them and then you output them. So very, very low level, but you've got complete control. And some others like Soundtrap or Foundation are using lots of what we call high level web audio nodes like these ones here, and the DAO is made of a graph. So there are advantages and disadvantages to uh, each uh, of these uh, approaches, and a very few, very, very few limited open source projects of this kind, because it's a bit like writing Photoshop. Uh, the, the complexity is huge, and uh, it takes years uh, to develop them. The, the commercial ones I talked earlier, like Logic Audio, uh, there are dozens of years of development by a lot of people. And only one uh, is compatible with third-party plugin. It's on Pet Studio. And the format was called Web Audio Module, and it was created in that time, in 2015, by uh, Jari Clemola, one of the creators of the company. 
So where are we now? So we've been the, the improving this uh, format that started in 2015. And now we, uh, I present to you Web Audio Modules version two. So what has changed? First, uh, I will show you a demo and through the demo I will explain. Okay, so this is a, a, an online host um, that is coming from the GitHub SDK, uh, the GitHub repo. It's a GitHub repo, and uh, you can load, for example, some plugins. So this MIDI keyboard is a plugin. This MIDI keyboard is a plugin, and you can then uh, load just using uh, some URI uh, an instrument. For example, this one, uh, its URI is here. It can be an absolute or a relative URI. Uh, by just using uh, the URI, you click the load plugin button, and here we loaded uh, a UI made of web components. So it's a web, a single web component. Each knob is a web component. And inside, you've got uh, WASM code, WebAssembly code, because this is a port of a very famous C++ native plugin. So, so you, can, uh, you can play this. Okay, and but for the, the story, this one uh, is a, a part of the Oberheim OBXD. It's a synthesizer that has been used on the song Jump by Eddie Van Allen. It's a very uh, uh, accurate reproduction. And you can have also uh, some other effects like this one. This is not an instrument, it's an effect. So this is the unprocessed sound. So the unprocessed sound. And we uh, uh, are providing with the SDK lots and lots of examples written in pure JavaScript, written using DSL, domain-specific languages like FOST or C sound that comp are specialized for writing DSP code and that compile directly to WebAssembly. Uh, we've got also example with using TypeScript, using React, using Vue.js, using different kind of, um, of uh, development approaches, using building system uh, and so on. Uh, and also, we are providing this example uh, that is a, a composite plugin. It's a plugin that is handling uh, different plugin configurations. And uh, uh, as, I, as I can, by clicking here, uh, instantiate on the fly, uh, sub plugins that means that the parameters that this pedal board plugin is exposing is uh, uh, actually the sum of the parameters inside and when you've got the parameters that means that a host if i am inserting this into uh, uh, a song project in a digital audio workstation i will be able to automatize certain of these parameters so this uh, build uh, this uh, drop down menu is dynamic if i am removing something here the menu is adjusted because some events are sent from the the plugin to the host and for example if i am just adjusting the let's say the um, the input uh, uh, parameter of this this effect here, uh, I will be able to draw such curve directly on a track, on an audio track of my workstation. And uh, I will be able to automate it when I press the play button. Look at the button here. You can see this button is moving. And actually, the internal parameter is updated, interpolated at the sample rate at 44.1 kilohertz. 44. 1,100 1, times per second. So here, optimization is crucial. So let's go back to the presentation. So what we did is since the, the last version is that we improved uh, taking into we improved it taking into account all the evolutions of the different web standards. So WebAssembly, okay, now it's common. Uh, web components they are more mature before. They were using HTML and ports and things that became obsolete. obsolete. No, a WASM plugin is an ES6 module. So we are using dynamic import when I clicked on button or when I clicked the load button. And uh, we support different kind of plugins. It can be made of an audiograph in JavaScript, for example, or they can be made of, uh, made of single low level custom audio worklet node with a WASM module inside and so on. The different plugin parameters, they are handled by the WAM param manager object provided by the, the standard. I will uh, talk about this uh, later on, on, the, on the next slide. But as you can see, a plugin can have only two external 
exposed parameters like the two buttons from this red plugin, but internally it can be made of a hundred of nodes that each have two or three different internal parameters. How do I link these two buttons to the internal parameters? Uh, we are providing tools for that and for interpolating. If I am interpolating this pitch uh, parameter, this one, maybe I will have to interpolate dozens of internal parameters. So all these things is done and it was not available on the previous version. So the focus was also uh, done on performances because the host can be written as an audio worklet itself, like the DAWs here. This one is an audio worklet node. This one is an audio worklet. So you will have some custom code running in the audio thread. If your plugin is also based on custom code running on the audio thread, then we can talk directly from audio thread to audio thread. So the communication between host and plugins will be highly optimized. So we rely on shared array buffers, ring buffers, and we uh, manage to do what we call the audio thread isolation that makes possible to, to interpolate uh, hundreds of parameters. So uh, indeed. So let me. Um, just uh, illustrate what I meant by different parameters uh, linking. So if I've got one knob here that corresponds to one parameter of a GAN node for adjusting a volume, I can have another knob linked to two different parameters. So if I interpolate this one, I will have to interpolate both parameters. This is quite complex and is taken into account uh, by the, the SDK. Let's look at the interoperability. So I showed you already a guitar, a tube guitar amplifier simulation loaded in the example host. It can be also loaded in a single HTML page and the code is really, really super simple. So in order to load a plugin, you need uh, its uh, URL. Let me see where it is. Yes. Uh, yeah, you need its URL and this is how you import it. And when you import it, you get a sort of factory that you can use to get a, the UI and to get uh, the plugin instance, the audio node. And then you connect them as any regular uh, standard web audio node. You can even mix it with an, an audio graph made of low level uh, audio nodes. And here is a demonstration of uh, this plugin in the commercial uh, DAO uh, Amped Studio. So let me just first uh, load it. So it's uh, exactly the same uh, as we showed before. I can uh, drag and drop uh, a dry guitar sound that I recorded uh, a few months ago. So, and if I play this sound unprocessed, this is what I get. And now I turn on the plugin and. And indeed, Ampet Studio is uh, starting to uh, use uh, this standard. So let me show you. Uh, I've got uh, maybe one minute how you, you could, can build in seconds WebAssembly uh, uh, plugins uh, using the first uh, domain specific language. So we developed an IDE that can compile directly code in the browser. So the compiler is itself in WebAssembly in the browser. So I can take, for example, some example here. I can run them, I can try them directly in my browser. So let me drag and drop the same sample as earlier. Okay, and, and if you like it, you can even build the GUI. So in 30 seconds, let me generate a WAM2 plugin. So you can add the texture, you can change the look of the knobs. Okay, I won't have time to uh, change all these things, but uh, we've got a very complete uh, uh, GUI builder. And when everything is okay, you can try it real time. So the plugin is, uh, the code is generated, the plugin is, uh, 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 okay, create it so you can try it. And if you like it, you can also download it as a zip with the source code, or you can try it in an independent web page. And if this works, you can just try it anywhere and load it in any application by using the URL. So here is it, and I can run it here.
And this is pure WebAssembly code running uh, inside high performance code. So uh, I don't have time. Uh, I will conclude. So uh, everything is open source. Uh, it's made of four different GitHub repository. One is the abstract API. One uh, uh, is made of examples, and two of them are the SDK. Uh, also as npm modules and you can uh, reach us on uh, on um, slack there is a channel here also uh, okay i don't have time to show that but i showed already that uh, we can make a plugin that is acting as a host and that manages groups of internal plugins uh, i've got i had other demos for that but i don't have time and also some uh, independent developers started to develop um, collaborative sequencers, sort, sort of collaborative synchronous collaborative DAOs, where uh, multiple people can tweak different plugins. And it's all made of uh, WAMs. So all these things are WAM plugins. And uh, if you, we uh, all open the same session with the share the URL, we can uh, start uh, making music all together in real time. So this has been done by uh, one, one de independent developer who finally joined the group and helped us improving the standard. So for example, this thing here is also pure WebAssembly code uh, compiled with same script. End. Okay, so conclusion, uh, the standard is rather stable now, comes with many examples, and we are adding new examples uh, regularly. It works uh, on one commercial digital audio workstation. We presented it uh, to the soundtrap.io team uh, at Spotify. They liked it a lot, and now it's a more business uh, decision to uh, open to third-party developers or not. And soon, soon we will uh, release a full-scale open source DAO, uh, not of the same quality as the commercial ones, but uh, we want developers to, to, to have a sort of a skeleton to start building uh, an open source digital audio workstation. OK, I am done. <laughs> I, I, I take a bit too long. Well, thank you very much. Um, we still have some time at the end for questions. Um, so let's maybe um, take, take the next presentation first and then whatever time at the end we have, we can dedicate to questions because I think it's also the last uh, thing of the conference. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Michael or Michelle. Yeah. Um, for Thank the you. presentation. Um, this was amazing. This was super cool. The power of a URL um, and also what you said about uh, the DAW uh, as Google Docs uh, sequence at a party. I have it open here. Yeah. So uh, if I if I had time, I I I I wished I could make a demo because it's fun. Uh, uh, by the way, we presented uh, uh, this for two hours to the Web Audio Working Group, <laughs> and uh, so they are aware of what we are doing. So uh, we are trying to push a bit the limits of what can be done with uh, with web audio, web components, web assembly, uh, and um, yeah, the, the I'd say the contributions from the professional developers. It was only performance, performance, performance. Mm -hmm. So compared to the previous version that was more made from the academic world. Here, a lot, a lot of time has been uh, taken about parameters automation, like anim, anim, you know, animating hundreds of parameters in real time, and um, using uh, shared array buffers, ring buffers, and uh, and so on. So, hi everyone. My name is Romain Fouquet. I'm a PhD student at Imeria in France, and I'm very happy to present uh, today our paper. JS, we had winning common web interface components from JavaScript addiction. This work was done with Pierre Lapedri and Roma Rouva. In this work, we present an automated solution, JS we have, that automatically replaces bootstrap components with accessible alternatives that do not rely on JavaScript. Indeed, today on the web, the major component frameworks all rely on JavaScript for making their components interactive. Uh, we specifically focused on Bootstrap as it, is, as it is by far the most popular component framework used today on the web. And as the entirety of all interactive Bootstrap components uh, relies on JavaScript. Using the technique that we are present, um, we, can, we are able to replace almost all of Bootstrap uh, components 
And even though we specifically targeted uh, Bootstrap in this work, the same technique can also be applied to other component frameworks. But you may be wondering why we will, why we as web developers and website owners would want our website not rely on JavaScript for their interactivity. There are actually numerous reasons for that. Um, if we were able to replace the JavaScript implementation uh, that makes the components interactive by smaller alternatives that do not rely on JavaScript, that would make the page smaller and smaller pages can load faster. And we know that high, um, so faster page loads can bring to higher conversion rates. Also, as, uh, as we don't have to wait for the JavaScript to become available, to be downloaded, uh, for the components to become interactive, that could also bring a lower time to interactive. We all have experienced pages where the pages, the pages seemed to be loaded, but we could click on the button and nothing would happen because the JavaScript was it wasn't loaded yet. If we are able to reduce the page size, that can also bring data savings and data cost uh, saving, especially for users that, especially for users that use those Hugo contracts. Um, also, if we are able to remove the dependency on JavaScript for the interactivity of components that can improve security, as we'll see later. Um, another point to consider is also that users do use content blockers. And see if, see if we are able to remove the dependency on some JavaScript that can improve the reliance of our website against the, that JavaScript being blocked. And the last point is uh, using JS we have can bring energy savings, as we'll see later. So if we are able to, if we are able to replace the JavaScript implementation with smaller uh, no script alternatives, we will be able to do all that. And you saw it coming, that exactly what we did. Um, if you have ever used Bootstrap, you know how, how easy it is to add one of uh, the, its pre-built component to one of your web page. Say you want to add a drop down menu to one of your web page. You start by writing the following markup, a button for the drop down button and a list for the drop down menu. And this doesn't rely on JavaScript at all since this is just some HTML market. Then you add some bootstrap CSS classes for styling the drop down button and the menu. Still, this doesn't rely on JavaScript at all since this is just some CSS, but the button is not interactive yet. To make the dropdown interactive, you add another attribute that enables the bootstrap behavior implemented in JavaScript. So that does rely on JavaScript. And so if JavaScript is not available, uh, we lose the interactivity. We can't open the dropdown menu anymore. So with JS we had, we rely on some variations of the checkbox hack, which isn't actually a hack, but more like an interesting use of checkboxes, hence the name. And to use the checkbox hack, we need a checkbox, of course, and a label that is linked to the checkbox so that when we activate the label, that would be the drop-down button, it actually activates the checkbox. And we need some CSS so that the visibility of the drop-down menu can be toggled based on the state of the checkbox. So in this example, the checkbox is visible, but in real life, of course, it would be hidden. But this doesn't scale very well. We, are, we have to, if we were to write that manually, we would have to repeat that implementation of the checkbox hack for each component. So we introduce JS we have that automates that and allows this technique to scale. And the JS we have is actually a plugin for an existing uh, HTML preprocessor, post HTML. And JS we have generates the, some variations of the checkbox hack that we just saw for pretty much all of the bootstrap components that are interactive. Using an existing HTML preprocessor allows us, us uh, to easily integrate, integrate into existing stacks, 
especially for bund in bundlers, such as Webpack, and in web server middlewares. And since the implementation, the variations of the checkbox hack are now factored out in the plugin in JS we have. We, it's worth it to have a well-tested components, well-tested uh, NoScript alternatives that do not rely on JavaScript, especially uh, well-tested for regarding the accessibility. And JS we have only relies on the bootstrap attributes and classes, so there is no need no change uh, needed to the existing code base that use uh, that currently use Bootstrap. So it's basically a dropping replacement. Um, to make the interdict setup, the interdict deployment setup of JS we have clear, um, it's meant to be used as a server side plugin that is either in a static side generation context or as a server side rendering context, meaning it either generates the page once or it's or in a, so in an SSG context, or each time some user requests the page, so in a SSR context. So it's a server side plugin, but it's not meant to be used as a proxy or client side. So here's a list of all the interactive bootstrap components. And here's whether they are supported, they can be supported by JS we have or not. We can see that out of the 14 interactive uh, components of Bootstrap, only two of them cannot be supported by JS we have currently. And one of them isn't uh, actually isn't supported by Bootstrap anymore. It's been dropped by Bootstrap version three. So the only current component that JS we have cannot support is this called spy which is a kind of table of contents that highlight the that highlights the current uh, section of the page. So as we wanted to get a better idea of the actual coverage of our solution, we did a web crawl. We crawled uh, 20k plus web pages. And on that set of web pages, we found 3k plus web pages that were using Bootstrap JavaScript. And, and have uh, and had a bootstrap component on that page. On that graph, you can see that really not all bootstrap components are equal. There are actually three components, the collapse dropdown and model components that are way more popular than the others. And we can see that the only component that we cannot support, this core spy is actually not popular at all currently. It's used by less than 4% of web pages in our code. And so on, la on that subset, uh, there are 1,300 plus uh, web pages that used a, a supported version of Bootstrap. So remember that this is a server-side plugin and so should be evaluated by the developers and website owners on their own website. But we still went ahead and measured the overhead of JS we have, since it generates HTML and that HTML is appended to the HTML document. So we, um, on that subset of supported web pages, we applied uh, JS we have and measured the overhead on the compressed HTML document. And the, that, over the, that overhead is actually very manageable since we found that the median overhead is actually less than 5%. Um, also note that we may now be able to remove JavaScript, bootstrap JavaScript, and taking that into account may actually decrease the total size of the page. So before we talk about security, uh, I know you are eager to see it in action. So here are three quick demos. First, a demo of the dropdown menu. We can see that we can open the dropdown either using the pointer or a usual keyboard navigation. Here's another demo for the tabs component. Here again, we can either use the pointer or usual keyboard navigation. Here, what's interesting to note is that we are not using checkboxes, but radio buttons, as we want the tab uh, panels to be mutually exclusive. The same is true for the accordion 
component. Here again, we can use the pointer or keyboard navigation. And here again, we are using radio buttons as we want the accordion panels to be mutually exclusive as well. So regarding security, as I talked uh, about uh, it earlier, during our code, we found that almost 60% of domains that were using Bootstrap JavaScript were actually using uh, the Bootstrap version that was uh, vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So if we are able to remove the dependency on Bootstrap JavaScript using JS we have, we would be able to enforce a stricter content security policy and now that we don't rely on JavaScript for the interactivity, the, the interactivity of components, we may maybe even be able to remove the JavaScript uh, on the page and enforce an even stricter content security policy that would actually forbid all execution of JavaScript client side. That would basically make our web pages bulletproof uh, against, against all kinds of cross-site scripting. Regarding the potential energy savings I mentioned earlier, we investigated the, the energy consumption on 31 web pages where we were able to block the bootstrap JavaScript. So we repeatedly loaded these uh, web pages, uh, first using bootstrap JavaScript and then using JS we had and that time uh, blocking the bootstrap JavaScript. And we can see that on these two low to medium end devices, mobile devices, we found energy savings, median energy savings of four and 11 persons. So if you are mainly browsing the web during a day, that could translate to uh, around half an extra hour of battery life each day. You may be thinking that using uh, JS Rehab would be hard in an existing stack. But as it is a, a plugin for an existing HTML preprocessor, it's actually just a couple of lines to add to your existing configuration. Here's an example for the bootstrap configuration. It's just another plugin to add to the configuration. And you can try which uh, we have out today using the code in this repository. And if you want extra details about our methodology, you can have a look at uh, the paper that DOI or in the link below. And a fun fact to conclude, this presentation itself has actually been powered by JS we had without a single byte of runtime JavaScript. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer the questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Romain. Um, do we have questions from the audience? Let's see, chat is silent. Does anyone raise a hand? No. So um, in this case, I have a question, um, but it's twofold. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's a nice remark. Yeah, uh, indeed, very nice to put in here. Um, so my question is, uh, is twofold. So the first one is, um, what mo most people would have done is um, if they realized there's a, an optimization potential, they would have just gone to the source, in this case Bootstrap, open a pull request and ask, can you replace your JavaScript implementation with this other thing? So why didn't you do that? And then the, the second part of the question is um, accessibility, because um, if you look at some of the JavaScript um, that people use on their pages, they use it for bad things, but in some cases they use it for good things as well, like in this case, improve accessibility. Um, did you check with accessibility experts, or maybe you are ex uh, accessibility experts yourselves, um, did you check if uh, you lose on accessibility by removing JavaScript? Yeah, so regarding the first part of the question, we didn't went to contribute to Bootstrap because um, actually Bootstrap itself that, that cannot play that role. A bootstrap is a piece of JavaScript that you would embed in your web page client side. And so the whole point is to replace the, that JavaScript. So we have to, uh, um, to transform the web page on the server before selling it to the client. 
that's basically the whole point of the, the approach. So we can't um, change, modify, modify the, uh, the page client side. And so regarding accessibility, so I, I indeed, uh, I basically became <laughs> an accessibility expert for, for that project. And we did indeed uh, test uh, the, the, the components uh, on desktop and on mobile. Uh, we tested the, the tab navigation and the screen, the screen reader navigation. So we made sure that uh, all the components were usable um, as asked by the WCAG. So they are all operable uh, using the keyboard and the screen, the screen reader um, navigation. So we can use all of that uh, with no, no issue whatsoever. And so the, and yeah, you basically talking about uh, also some kind of area, especially area state attributes. So indeed we can change the state of area state attributes uh, such as um, area opened, but we don't actually need them since the browsers already announced the state of checkboxes and other native but, uh, the native components such as radio buttons. So it's not the same, the exact same uh, behavior than bootstrap, but it is also accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so regarding my first part um, of the question, this was this would of course then, so assuming you made these changes and brought them into Bootstrap, this would of course not modify the existing web, but this would modify future versions that would use Bootstrap. Um, so this, this um, would still then probably scale in the end um, rather than... Yeah, be systems. because basically that would, uh, I mean, contributing to Bootstrap in that way would basically be contributing to the documentation of Bootstrap. We would ask the developers to copy and paste the code I shown for I showed for the checkbox hack. We'd ask to to copy and paste that uh, checkbox and label and CSS code. So yeah, it would go at the expense of the authors who right now have an easy job. Exactly. Would, they would would have a harder job. Um, exactly. But yeah, I mean, this is uh, just a different. I was just curious why. You didn't uh, choose that way. Um, I think the, the um, approach is very interesting. Um, you So is there any other audience question? Because I'm consuming all the question time myself, which is maybe not nice. <laughs> but you can see I'm also very interested in this. Um, <laughs> there's no other question I ask you one more, um, which is the proxy use case. So um, you mentioned about, upon it briefly in the presentation. but um, there have been attempts, um, so Google, for example, had the uh, Google Web Lite um, proxy that would on the fly simplify versions of websites. Um, did you look at all into running a proxy like that, just as a research project maybe, or not, uh, not in production? Yeah, so there are indeed uh, other projects or another academic project that was published in dub 21 I think, JS Cleaner is uh, cited in, in the paper. Uh, basically, what those uh, projects do is that they, they try to process the JavaScript as a proxy and remove the JavaScript that is not used with a proper definition of use or useful. Um, but he, here we are actually going further. We are replacing, rewriting the JavaScript that is useful, that, that's uh, JavaScript for the interactivity part. And replacing that that with uh, with no no script alternatives, um, I don't think that uh, we could deploy this. We could deploy JS we have as a proxy, uh, at least because that would raise um, other privacy questions, since that would basically centralize um, all the traffic into one or a few proxies. And maybe here we focused on deploying that server side so that uh, developers can evaluate if JS we have is a good candidate on their website. Because uh, if we were to deploy that as a proxy, um, it would be it would have to handle perfectly all websites. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, there has been one more remark in the chat um, from Pian Tuan. Um, Pian Tuan, you want to just go yourself? 
Yes, thanks. Yeah. Um, super interesting presentation, thanks. Um, yeah, I was wondering maybe because the, the post processing of HTML might be considered as a burden, would this make sense to implement those strategies as web components? Although I know that web components require some some amount of JavaScript themselves. So I just wanted to, to, to have your opinion on, on this. You're muted, Anna. No, I'm unmuted. I'm unmuted. Uh, I don't know if web components could actually be used for that, but we could in, indeed uh, benefit from some kind of client side templating, if that makes sense. Uh, we're using some parts of the HTML like writing that HTML once, and we're using that uh, client side without JavaScript, that we could benefit from that. I don't think that the web components in the present form can really help in, in our case. There's some work in the web components world to um, sort of have um, pre-rendered uh, of sorts web components so that you don't need to access the JavaScript, but that you already know by looking at the uh, markup, what will be the final representation once the JavaScript has run. Um, so this could maybe in the future um, solve this. Um, but yeah, right now, um, especially when you think cross-browser, um, it's still uh, kind of a problem. Um, I realized we didn't really answer or provide answers to questions that uh, might have come up for uh, Michelle. Um, so maybe if anyone has uh, questions for Michelle, now would still be uh, some time. And uh, if not, uh, let's already thank uh, Roma for the, for the presentation. Thank you. Great stuff indeed. <laughs> so last chance to ask questions to Michelle as well. Yeah, Dominique. You raised your hand. Uh, yeah, I, I guess um, maybe too complex a question for such a short amount of time. But but you were referring uh, of web audio module as a standard, and I understand. No, uh, yeah, I, I, I know uh, the standard world is right. complicated to use. It depends on the context. <laughs> but but, but yeah. I actually, I'm curious if you think. I mean. Uh, What's interesting is that the standard here is really a standard for web applications, not for web browsers. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I wonder if you see a need for something like that to emerge out of your experience with web audio module. Uh, I'd say yes, uh, but the first step before going to more formalization and so on is to try to convince the big actors from the industry to. Uh, 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 at least be interested in that. Uh, I mean, uh, one of the four vendors uh, already uh, supports uh, the, the, this kind of plugins. Uh, we also presented for maybe two hours what we are doing to Andrew McPherson, uh, the C CEO of um, Soundtrap. Uh, that belongs to Spotify. They were very interested, but there are different kind of problems before they, they jump. The first one is that um, they think that audio worklet and uh, is not supported well in Safari for the moment and uh, on mobile devices. So uh, as we focused a lot on performances, they decided not to jump uh, to this kind of development uh, for the moment. Uh, on the contrary, uh, on Page Studio and, and BandLab, you know, they started with WebAssembly code, audio worklets, uh, not five years ago. It, they started with um, scripting and, and so on, but they, uh, they, they, they decided to reconceive, re 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 uh, rebuild their whole system using audio worklets and WebAssembly code uh, in 2018. So, um, well, for for the moment, it's a bit difficult to uh, to uh, to get the the attention of uh, of all these vendors. And if they don't support this, as we don't have any open source uh, digital audio workstation for the moment, uh, it's a big problem. But for sure, uh, we'd like to uh, to get some help. Maybe, um, well, I wouldn't say. Uh, 
make some things uh, as formal as you know the low level uh, APIs that we've got right now because the, our first uh, need was to, to show things. I mean, show, maybe show demo and, uh, and things like that before uh, you know going to the specification and all the steps that we are using with, uh, with browser standards. Thanks. But what, what do you think yourself, uh, Dominique? You think that we should, uh, uh, well, we should I'm do it? I'm very interested, I guess, in the broad space of uh, web apps, web service interoperability, which right now is left to, I guess, more of the open source approach, which is the one you're, you're taking with one. But the, the value we get for standards uh, for you know, lower level interoperability would probably have its use for higher level ones. Uh, and I guess another question this brings to my mind is with WebAssembly bridging the native and web world, it may even be that something that is a web audio module becomes an interesting standard uh, for native uh, DAOs. Yeah, native. Uh, actually I, I didn't show that, but we have. We had at least uh, with the previous version uh, everything running in native applications while right, using different tricks like write a native plugin that uh, is uh, embedding a netless uh, Chromium browser, for example, that could load any web audio application inside, rerouting, you know, the input outputs, the MIDI events, and so on. So, uh, Jari Clemola presented uh, something in 2018 at the Web Audio Conference in Berlin. And uh, Amped Studio, right now, is also doing the reverse, I mean, running native apps in the web app. Uh, well, for this, you need to install a small local web server. But as soon as you've got a local web server that opens uh, web sockets and so on, you can reroute, you know, having some sort of virtual routing between native and, uh, and web applications. So if you bought uh, for thousands of dollars of native plugins, you can use them in your web projects. And um, of course, people won't be able to use your plugin uh, if you share your project your project, but you can at least uh, uh, use it to uh, freeze the tracks. I mean, uh, replace the audio with the compute, the processed audio before sharing. And uh, then, then it, can, it, it is usable. So you've got both uh, worlds that are trying to work together. The, to speak frankly, the trick with the Chromium browser was a, a hog in terms of uh, memory usage and so on compared to, uh, <laughs> to the same things without the browser. Uh, but it worked, it worked pretty well. And uh, people from the industry, they are uh, looking more and more closely to what we're doing. So we've got people from Ableton. Ableton is a big actor in the music industry that is already uh, developing lots of things using web audio. So they think that having, uh, well, lower scale applications available for free on the web could uh, attract people and then make them buy their, uh, you know, premium uh, product. And uh, you can find also Antares who is making the Autotune famous plugin. They just tried like this, okay, let's port it to WebAssembly and let's include this in uh, some commercial online audio workstation. So one of them, as the real autotune uni universally acclaimed plugin running in the browser. Uh, I don't know um, if uh, this uh, was a success in, ter in terms of uh, well, uh, uh, people using it, but uh, at least uh, I think the, the big actors, they are well testing the, the market. Because what we can do with the web, and uh, especially during the pandemia, is, uh, well, work differently. As you see, our conference is completely remote. So now you've got uh, records that have entirely been done using online audio workstations. And uh, what do you get? You push a button, publish, and like this, it's on Spotify. It's, uh, it's on your social network, uh, online and so on. So it makes things much easier for producing, distributing. 
All right. Not well, yet at, at um, professional now, level, but uh, go on for hours and hours and hours. But we are officially out yeah. of time, so people have to jump to different. Okay, okay. And, uh, it's the beginning of their day. For me, it's the end of my day. Um, so I wish we could all go for dinner now and have a post uh, conference discussion. Um, this is virtual, so we get together from everyone in the world um, without traveling. That's a good thing. We get to just use URLs and that's a good thing. But the only thing we don't get is a post conference dinner. But nevertheless, uh, yeah, thank you all for having been here. Thank you all for presenting. Thanks to the thank two you. guests um, who presented. And um, yeah, also just thank you for contributing in general. If you just uh, stopped by and came by and uh, learned something new, that's uh, the tracks uh, objectives achieved. And uh, with that, uh, we are officially concluded and ending the track. Uh, good rest thank of you. your all in the world. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye.